Okay. Okay. Welcome. We'll call the meeting to order at 7.06 p.m. August 16th, 2021, GBOS regular meeting in the Girdwood Community Room. The Girdwood Board of Supervisors, its committees and subcommittees are subject to the Alaska Open Meetings Act as found in Alaska Statute 44.62.310 and Anchorage Municipal Code 1.25 Public Meetings. The Girdwood Board of Supervisors operates under the Girdwood Public Meetings Standards of Conduct. We'll do roll call. Brianna Sullivan, co-chair, Parks and Recreation and Cemetery Supervisor. Uh, Mike Edrington, co-chair and uh, land use supervisor. Guy Wade, part and pharma supervisor. And on the Sassy Road Supervisor. Great. And Jennifer is out of the room at the moment, but is present. Any disclosures this evening? Okay, thank you. Agenda revisions and approval. Brianna, I have a yes. suggested revision on the agenda. Uh, real quick, guys, Jennifer, could you state your name for attendance, please? Sure, Jennifer Wingard, um, Public Safety. Thanks. Okay, for the tonight's meeting agenda approval, Guy? Yeah, if we um, could move the uh, Girdwood Fire Department request for hose replacement in the old business. Um, this has been, we've talked about this for um, a, few, a couple months since we've been talking about the budget and um, just to move the whole process along of procuring the new hoses. Um, we'll see what the board thought about bringing that into old business and so we could go ahead and make a vote on it today. Okay, so we have a suggestion to move number 13, new business, up to the item on old business. Any discussion on that? Well, I'll second it. Seconded. We do a voice vote. Uh, I can call it off since we got oh, a hand on. Roll call, please, Kyle. Uh, Brianna Sullivan? Yes. Mike Edgington? Yes. Uh, Jennifer Wingard? Yes. Guy Wade? Yes. Amanda Sassy? Yes. Passes 5-0. Okay, great. So we have a revised agenda. And we move any move to approve the agenda then with the revision. I guess we just did that. Uh, June 21st, 2021, regular meeting minutes approval. Move to approve. I'll second that. We, have, we need to do a roll call every time or voice vote or just... You can second. see if anybody dissents. Any dissents? Okay, July 19th, 2021, regular meeting minutes approval. I'll move to approve. Second. Second, thank you, Guy. Any dissents? July 20th, 2021, GBOS budget work session one, minutes approval. Move to approve. I'll second that. Any dissents? Okay, July 26th, 2021, MOA GBOS quarterly meeting minutes approval. Move to approve. I'll second it. Thank you. Any dissents? And lastly, August 13th, 2021, GBOS budget work session two minutes approval. Move to approve. Second. I second, Guy. Thank you. Any dissents? Okay, announcements. The public is encouraged to ask questions and provide comment. Please raise your hand and wait to be acknowledged. To help discussion stay productive, please direct your comments to the board rather than other members of the public and keep your comments focused on the business under discussion. Please be respectful of everyone's opinions. Planning Department Administrative Site Plan Review 2021-0100 scheduled as a non-public hearing with the Planning Director's decision date of August 26, 2021. More information available is at the link provided in the attachment for the agenda. HLB RFP results for development of portion of HLB parcels 6-11, 6-016, and 6-017 are available for review on the HLB website at a link here. I, I do have a quick question on um, the penultimate item, the planning 
Department of Ministries Site Plan Review uh, 2021-0100. Do you know which uh, project that is? Kyle, can you do you remember? Uh, sorry, I was in the middle of doing a correction here. Can you say that again? Yeah, sure. The, the item, the penultimate item in announcements, can you remind us what application that is? I think there's a link there. Yes, uh, let me pull it up here. Announcements. This one right here, the... That one, yeah. 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 Is that the Aliaska Highway? Yeah. Yes, so this is uh, uh, Joe Bell Development off Aliaska Highway. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mike. Okay, introductions, presentations, and reports. Number one, GBS Resolution of Service for Girdwood Fire Department, Captain Matt Olson. Supervisors has drafted a, a resolution gratitude for Captain Olson. I'm the Girdwood Board of Supervisors. Hereby resolves to honor Girdwood Fire and Rescue Senior Captain Matthew Olson. Whereas Senior Captain Matthew Olson joined an auxiliary firefighter and Anchorage Fire Department at Station 15 in Girdwood in the summer of 1997. And whereas Senior Captain Matt Olson has provided fire, rescue, and emergency medical care to Girdwood residents and visitors for 24 years. And whereas Senior Captain Olson has excelled as a firefighter, fire service instructor, engineer, advanced life support EMT3, captain and senior captain during his tenure at Girdwood Fire and Rescue. And whereas Matt Olson has excelled, taught, and inspired generations of Girdwood firefighters and is there Therefore, be it resolved that the Girdwood Board of Supervisors thanks Senior Captain Matt Olson for 24 years of service providing exemplary services to the Girdwood Valley Service Area. Thank you, Captain Olson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief okay. Weston. Thank you. Thank you all of you for coming over from the fire station. Thank you. And for your service. Nessa, you'll have to give him a big, big hug. Oh, for sure. <laughs> he's, very, he's very shy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, Guy, you can read the, the last sentence. Passed and approved by the Girdwood Board of Supervisors the 16th day of August 2021. Great. Thank so we you. We should formally vote on that. Okay, we do need to formally vote on that. Okay. I will second the resolution. All right. Roll call. Oh. Brianna Sullivan? Yes. Mike Edgington? Yes. Jennifer Wingard? Yes. Guy Wade? Yes. Amanda Sassy? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you. Okay, number two, planning department proposed ordinance that requires MOA administrative site plan review approval to recognize federal mining patents in the GOS and GDR districts. Do we have someone here to present on that? Dave's here with us. Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. This is uh, Dave Whitfield with this county of Anchorage Plan Department. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for allowing me to join you this evening uh, to present this ordinance. Uh, some of you may remember uh, the version of this ordinance from about two years ago, wherein uh, the ordinance recognized uh, existing patents, state and federal mining claims, uh, and allowed development of those uh, properties under those claims. 
this in mining claims would be required to go through the planning department for approval in addition to the Department of Natural Resources. They would have to meet uh, several approval criteria to include uh, the general standards for site plan approval as outlined in Chapter 3 of Title It might be background conversation, so go ahead. My apologies. So it, uh, it requires that uh, site plan approval, uh, the, the site plan approval criteria is outlined in Chapter 3, and the use specific standards outlined uh, in Chapter 5 for either natural resource extraction or land reclamation to be met. Um, the, uh, the, the requirement is. Uh, it's, it's a rather robust review, um, certainly more robust than the first version uh, that we presented. Um, it, uh, we believe that it, it does, in fact, uh, engage the public and is not a guarantee. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned, anyone looking to, uh, uh, to propose such a use under a, a mining pad would have to go to both municipality and the Department of Natural Resources this, uh, it, it would in fact allow for these uses under the, uh, the patent and mining claims in the GOS and the GDR districts. Now I have a map, if you wouldn't mind, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Yes, let me get out of here. I'll give you the screen. Yeah, go ahead. You should be able to share. You see this map? Not yet. Here we go. Okay, so the GDR district and GOS district encompass a fair amount of property in the Kirkwood area. However, most of that uh, property is undevelopable. Um, really only along the uh, New Seward Highway is where uh, we see this uh, any sort of development happening. So. This ordinance, as I said, I think is a, is a market improvement on, uh, on the first ordinance presented. And I want to make it very clear that this does not allow for uh, new patents. Uh, it doesn't allow for anyone looking to do natural resource extraction or land reclamation to come into the mining department and, uh, and, and submit for a and site plan review. What it does allow is it recognizes those existing patents, uh, those existing mining claims uh, recognized by, uh, by, state, by the state and federal government, and uh, it requires that, uh, that they go through a rather robust um, review by the mining department. So I'd be happy to answer any questions um, that, the, uh, uh, that the group might have. Um, yeah, well, thank you very much, and, and again, thank you very much for allowing me to uh, present to you. Hey, thank you, Dave. Uh, does the board have questions? Mike. I have two questions, Dave. Hope you can hear me. Um, yes, sir. The first one is, do you actually have a, um, any indication of where the patents currently are located? So what we have, uh, so actually I asked that question uh, today of, of the state. Uh, they have, have said that there are four to five uh, existing patents be within these districts. I asked specifics on where they were located and I unfortunately was not able to get that. So I, I can't tell you exactly where those properties are at at this moment uh, because they weren't able to provide me that information. But I, from what I understand, four to five uh, patents that, uh, that would be affected by this ordinance. Are you saying they couldn't provide them today or they will not provide them at all? No, I believe that they would provide them. Uh, I, I today and I wasn't able to get them. Okay. Do you think they will be available before this item goes in front of the assembly? Or planning uh, I, can, I can certainly ask, yes sir. 
And uh, my second question, if I can ask a second question. Um, my second one is the administrative site plan review is not, has no public hearing component, is that correct? No, sir, but there is a, uh, a section of the admin site plan review that uh, would require, or that could require, uh, engagement with the community in, in that we would send out uh, notices of administrative decision where the, the public could, in fact, participate. Okay, but there's no requirement for a local meeting or a public hearing, is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Uh, however, as, as with everything in Girdwood, uh, we always recommend that, that uh, any applicant coming into our office engage uh, the Girdwood Parks Department. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I have, I have one question, Dave. Who, who, who are, are, who's reviewing these? Did you say the Department of Natural Resources and the Muni? Yeah, so under the, the old ordinance, it recognized existing patents and only required them to uh, go through the Department of Natural Resources for approval. This particular ordinance requires both the Department of Natural Resources and the municipality to uh, approve their request. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Sorry, Any? I do have one more. Yes. Um, what's the schedule for making this change? Do you know what is it scheduled for a P for P and Z? No, sir. We've not yet scheduled it for a planning zone commission. Okay, so that means it's at least two or three months out. Uh, probably yeah, two months at least. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the public? Okay. Thank you, Dave. Thank you all for having me. Very much appreciated. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Okay, moving on to number three, legislative report. Senator Roger Holland, Representative James Kaufman. Are either of those people on the phone or online? No, not on the phone. Okay. Assembly members, John Weddleton, Suzanne LaFrance. John, are you there? John, you here? John, I can see you. It looks like you're unmuted, but are you there? You are having a hard time hearing you earlier. He's at the Hillside community, so he may not be available right now. Okay, 7.30, maybe check back in. Yeah. Okay, looks like Anchorage School Board plays on Kelly Lessons. We are here. Welcome. Hi. We'll be over at Hillside in just a little minute, so we'll, we'll switch places. Um, thanks for having me. Tomorrow is the first day of school, and I say that having come just from a back-to-school barbecue where the excitement and the hot dogs were both very palpable, um, and it was great to see parents and kids ready, and teachers ready and enthusiastic for a new year. Um, so kindergarten starts a week from now. They have a little bit of a break, uh, not a break, there's a time for kindergarten teachers to sort of assess each incoming student. Uh, but please, as we drive around, just be on the lookout for little ones at bus stops. Um, make sure you're driving safe. Um, school days are back to normal. So high school starts at 7.30, middle school at 8.15, elementary school at 9 a.m. Um, normal school days, normal school content, elementary, you guys hear me? Uh, elementary will have their specials like PE, uh, health, art, library. Um, middle and high school will have normal classes and normal lunch times. Um, this year, as many of you may be aware, ASD is uh, following what we're calling the Strong Start Plan, and that means that masking will be part of layered mitigation strategies to help keep our kids in school. Um, anybody that rides a, a school bus uh, will be wearing a mask. That's a federal requirement, same as if you hop on an airplane. Anybody inside of an ASD building is required to wear a mask. Uh, so students who are at recess do not have to do so, but if they're in the classroom, uh, they need to put them back on. 
Um, students with qualifying disabilities uh, can pursue mask exemptions as needed by going through a process at their school. And so families uh, whose kids are have a 504 plan or who qualify uh, can contact their school nurse or the health services department for that mask exemption. Volunteers are going to be welcome in schools this year, which is really exciting, uh, but they also need to follow protocols like signing in and again wearing masks. And just talk to your child's teacher if you're interested in, in volunteering. Um, and then the keep ASD symptom free uh, policy is continuing. So if a child has any symptoms, um, they do need to stay home, get tested. Um, tomorrow is our next school board meeting. Um, one of the items on the agenda will be the introduction of of our slightly revised uh, community sourced goals and guardrails. And our goals, just to kind of recap, oh gosh, about two years ago, the, district, the board, the then board members, began a process of collecting community values and visions and hope for the future. And there was a very slow process, very meticulous, that the board over the summer really finalized. And so we will be discussing these goals and guardrails. They're calling them Strategy 2026. Um, the key goals revolve around improving K through two reading proficiency, uh, grades three through nine math proficiency. And proficiency doesn't really mean just doing it, it means doing it well. Um, and the third major goal has to deal with graduating students who are life ready as well as college and or career ready. We heard students say they're ready, they want help adulting. And so that's really where, where that goal comes into mind. Um, and then uh, these are all posted on the board's agenda for tomorrow night. They'll be posted on the website final, pending approval. Um, there will be interim goals. So this year, the superintendent and her administration have interim goals to increase the reading proficiency, increase the math proficiency, building towards sort of a five-year vision. And so those are all spelled out. Um, and I can, I'm not sure what the best way to share things digitally with you guys is, but. Um, you can email them to me. Okay, and maybe I can and email I'll the links it. following. Okay, that's that a great idea. Great. Um, one of the successful indicators for college readiness is the completion of Algebra 2. And so bumping up the, the number of, the percentage of students, high school students, who complete Algebra 2 with an A, B, or C is one of those uh, signposts that we can really look for. Uh, so that's exciting. And then there are also a set of, in addition to those three main goals, reading, math, life, college, career, we also have a set of four guardrails, which are the thou shalt not. So the superintendent is not going to be leaving student groups underrepresented in lottery or application-based programs. The superintendent will not operate without a plan to develop a diverse or culturally responsive workforce. The superintendent will not allow unsatisfactory employee performance to go unidentified or unaddressed. And the superintendent will not operate elementary schools without mental health services. And that was certainly something that we heard a lot uh, about from the community. Um, our board meetings are really going to feature goal monitoring uh, front-loaded, so you'll be hearing a lot about progress towards those goals at the start of our board meetings. Uh, so that's something to look forward to as a community. Um, over the next month, students at all levels will be assessed to really see where they're at, which will help give their teachers guidance for where, they're, where they need to be. And as far as the future for the public and the school board, um, one thing I really wanted to share was that public input is welcome in lots of ways. I'm happy to answer your questions here in just a minute. Anybody is welcome to email the entire school board at any point in time. Emailing the board, it's at um, schoolboard at asdk12.org, is not the same, however, as providing written testimony. So there's a separate process if you want to provide written, telephonic, or in-person testimony. And I can email the appropriate link for that participation um, a little bit later. So uh, we welcome your emails, but some people were surprised. We received hundreds of emails about masking over the past couple of weeks, and some folks were surprised that their emails were not actually logged as testimony. So I just wanted to make that distinction. Um, 
the next meeting is tomorrow night at 6. And uh, just as a, a reminder, the board really hopes and expects the public to model polite decorum um, for our students. Um, and we look forward to hearing from the community members. Every person who speaks has their time, but we can't have a productive conversation with disruptions. Um, so with that, are there any questions that I can quickly address? Yes. I have a question. What does the enrollment look like this year compared to um, the it's, previous it's seven up. years? Yeah, that's a great question. What does enrollment look like? So coming into this fall, the administration was expecting about a 75% return rate from students who had gone to homeschool or the ASD virtual. Um, I can tell you that I just spoke with my own kid's school nurse and she said they have more than 100 new families. Um, there are people who are, who are moving and coming back and the number I've seen is 48,000, which suggests a huge uptick. Um, you know, that said, I understand that there are families right now who are pulling their kids out because of the mask policy, and there are also families who are pulling their kids out because they're afraid of um, the number of, of cases of COVID that are happening. So I think that number, the enrollment is certainly up from last year, but it's in flux even as of today. Um, so I think things are gonna sort of work themselves out over the next few weeks. Yes? In lieu of that first question, does enrollment include the online? Is there online? That's a great question. Only? I don't know. I'm going to guess yes, but I don't know, and I right. can follow up with that, okay. what the actual enrollment looks like. Yeah. Um, tomorrow night, I'm looking forward to answering a number of questions, including I had a few people send me, how are class sizes looking? And I think that's a great question because mm -hmm. one of the things we know is that, especially with the little ones, K through two, smaller class sizes are really effective ways for teachers to reach a kid. So if we can keep those class sizes at under 15, that would be awesome. And I don't really know what that looks like yet. And yet, yes? Is there any kind of metric as to when they, the school board will determine if there will be a change in the masking policy? I don't know. So to go back to the masking policy, a year ago, the school board delegated management of COVID to the superintendent. And so that, it's under her purview, essentially, not ours. There was actually a lot of um, confusion at the meeting two weeks ago. People were expecting the board to vote yes or no, but it wasn't an actionable, votable item. And so it's really in the superintendent's court as to what the masking policy looks like, at least right now as the board authorization has extended to her. Um, I have heard her say in emails that, you know, once once <coughs> rates go down, she, she pulled the mask mandate, um, or she retracted it over the summer. There was no mask mandate, it was optional. Um, case counts were significantly lower. And so I think we'd all love to go back to normal, but I haven't seen a specific metric that if we hit this threshold, um, I haven't seen anything anywhere that would say that we would change from masks required to masks optional. Uh, but I suspect that it may have to do with the high rate of community transmission. So I could say with fair, a fair degree of confidence, if we were to go to a low rate of community transmission, we would probably be looking at a different masking scenario. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, following up on these other questions about attendance, I, uh, I just wonder if you have a hypothesis for why that is, because I know that uh, of Anchorage's population in Alaska has been decreasing over the last what, four or five years now, mm -hmm. and jobs are still down, and uh, nationally there's an issue with more people homeschooling and maybe not returning after learning that they can. So why do you think our numbers are up? Why, why do I think the numbers are up? Well, I think that a lot of families who went to both ASD virtual and homeschooling last year found that it's very hard. Oh, okay. Um, and there is, I think, just a recognition that that's, it, it's challenging to keep your kids on track academically if you're not 
if you don't have as much time perhaps as you would like to dedicate to that task. So that could be part of it. Um, I do know, yeah, homeschool numbers are up. I know the long-term, you know, economic forecasts for Anchorage, you know, involve more people coming yeah. to Anchorage. Um, you know, it's a beautiful place to, if you can work remotely, you know, why not live in Girdwood or, or some other part of Anchorage? Um, so there may be some of that as well. Um, I would love to, I haven't seen an official report of numbers, but um, I would love to, to see that uh, as, as everybody figures things out. And so to clarify, are numbers up from 2020 or also up from 2019? I don't know. It was a, it was an email that I saw the number 48,000, which looks a lot more like the start of two years ago. Right. Um, last year it was down to... I used to know these things. Um, it was down significantly last year. Uh, but a, a large number of students were in ASD virtual. Um, so the, I think the in-person last year was around 37,000. And there may have been about 6,000 in ASD virtual. But those numbers fluctuated. As, especially in the spring as students came back to class and maybe little bit by little bit those enrollment numbers those ratios changed as people became more confident with the mitigation measures right. and parents were vaccinated thank you got one other question which yes. has nothing to do with masking or COVID okay, or, even, or even this school year okay great but um, as you've had higher engagement from uh, public in school board activities um, one thing that strikes me is we have obviously an assembly um, which has representatives across different districts. Mm -hmm. So people represent just a part of the community. And that gives you a closer tie to two representatives. With the school board, everyone's at large. So everyone has a degree of anonymity. Mm -hmm. And there isn't really a connection in the same way between communities and uh, school board members. So my question is, you know, is there, why is that? Is that just a choice or is it constitutional? Or what's the actual reason we don't have districts in the school board? And is there any way, you know, would it be considered? I think it's a great question. It's something that I pondered during the campaign mm -hmm. portion of my life uh, because I can, I will, Unofficially, I will say that running for a citywide office is a challenging proposition. Um, officially, I will say that it's my understanding that um, it's chartered that way. And so the assembly or the state has to change that. I don't think the district, the board itself, I don't think has the authority to change that charter. Um, okay. If it's the Anchorage charter, yeah, I think you're right. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it is an idea that I have thought about personally and I have heard other people um, express. I think that it's, I appreciate that the board divides the city into sevenths. So, you know, I'm getting to know Girdwood a little bit more this year uh, and looking forward to continuing that relationship. Uh, but it is a huge city and to connect with and keep your, your pulse on um, Girdwood and Chugiak and Spinard and the hillside, um, East Anchorage. It's just very, every, every school is different. Every, every sub-community is, is a little bit different. We have common values, uh, but you know, the student population may have different needs from one place to the next, and that's an important distinction. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Yeah. Okay, I will get back to you, the Board of Supervisors, with a little bit more information. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We have Weddleton on. John, are you there? You're really quiet, John, so you might have to speak really loud. Can you guys hear me okay? A little bit louder if you can. A little bit louder. There we go. How about that? That's better. Okay. Uh, is there a delay with the team's meeting? No. I, okay. Wait. Good. So, well, hello, everybody. Sorry, I missed most of the meeting. I just showed up. Uh, I did catch a little bit of Kelly's um, comment, Mike's question on the school board and, and districts and so on. And that obviously is a topic brought up often. But that is in the charter, and that would be something that would take a vote of the people to change. Um, the assembly can't do that. And, and I think Kelly, basically, we have uh, Crystal Kennedy and 
uh, Cameron President Dia, who were on the school board, and it was uh, Eric Croft. And they have noted that the role and the way that the school board operates is very different than what the assembly does. So it, it, you know, to look for a parallel, you know, whether by districts is a little something different than you know, what you get from the um, assembly. So I don't you know, I sympathize with anyone running citywide. Or, um, you know, there are probably, I think there are some advantages in having the school board, but that's just one kind of opinion here, um, that having them citywide. Um, a couple of things. Um, we, uh, sorry, going through some brief notes here. Uh, I guess the big issue and something that's taken a whole lot of time right now with me is the um, dealing with the homeless. And that is, uh, the mayor's made that kind of key issues and it's good. I think we're um, poised to make that, you know, we've dealt with it over the last several years, but having cleared out, um, you know, the earthquake and building up the police force and um, selling down LMP and um, getting the port on track, you know, we've kind of set ourselves up and we, we can now really address this and um, things, you know, he came in with a big proposal to do a, a very large shelter and tutor in Elmore. And, you know, I find it has many merits. It's the best way to go, I don't know for sure, but um, that did not get any traction in the assembly. But that did end things. It actually started a very close collaboration working with the mayor and his team to say, if not that, what, or, or how to make that happen in a way that could work. Um, issues where there's really no huge expense to do that, no source of funding to build it or to operate it. And also, of course, neighborhood pushback and so on. Um, and just the sheer size of it, some people are not important. But we have a team that is uh, back in uh, Zolotel, Wisconsin, myself working with Craig Campbell uh, and uh, um, Craig Campbell and uh, uh, John Morris, the doctor who's the homeless guy, and uh, then the Third guy, I can't remember it was on the set line before. Uh, but he, um, you know, it's, it's been a good, good um, kind of problem solving process, kind of defining exactly what we're looking for, what are all the options. You know, we met uh, last couple of weeks, we met for several hours today, we'll meet uh, two more times this week, and we're really pushing it to have some way uh, going forward so that if anything needs to be in the budget for next year, we anticipate it will be. Uh, we'll be ready for it when the budget's introduced. It needs to be prepared in September, so a lot has to happen in a hurry. So, so it's anyway, it's that, that I think in the press was that things aren't happening and um, the, the assembly's not working from the mayor. We are actually working you know, quite well, I think, mean, actually, you know, on this issue more intensely than we had verbals on other issues that were, um, were also not, you know, what the assembly got very involved in. Alaska Modernization Program, when it first came out, or it was a proposal to get traction with the assembly either, but we created, just like we are now with the homeless, kind of a process where we'll be involved in uh, Chris Concert, really, kind of shepherded that through, and now we have um, the users on board with a plan on what they'd like to see done. We still have to work on the funding, but we did get controlling cement terminals, which if you finish next year, kind of broke that off. So, so this kind of process works and gets a result. It does slow things down. Um, and there were hopes for the administration they have the park structure ready for winter. And that, I think, is very spectacular. Now, um, and it certainly won't happen at this point. So we need some intermediate um, action and then also looking at some of the long term. So that's been taking a, a, a lot of time. But uh, still had time to do something that I was really um, happy to see and came and stuck my foot on the shovel at the clinic's groundbreaking. And, and that is a tremendous record, but I think everyone listening knows. And, and in my first year on the assembly, it was, we were scrambling to find a way to just get another trailer attached to it and worked on a code change and made that happen. And to see that very humble event turn ultimately into um, getting a really gorgeous new um, clinic we built is it's really it's very exciting for me. So, um, so anyway, that was a that was, um, nice distraction from doing the whole lesson. Um, also, the, uh, through the Community Economic Development Committee, we are continuing to look at also be a long term thing on how the municipality asserts easements and rights that we've kind of neglected over the years. Uh, also, assessors' routines for valuing large vacant lots. And I, I know this is an issue. Eagle River Hillside and also in 
everyone and there's some there's some very odd anomalies on how it's done very similar pods very close to each other probably very differently and then i want to find a way to make it very transparent how those things are how raw land is, is valued and then get some continuity between different very similar pieces of property we're also looking at uh, kind of new, new look uh, changes to title 21 and title 23 uh, the title, which may not be specifically occurred, but it may spin off of it. And these are proposals from the administration out of Trump. And, uh, I've got a list of about 20 items, and we're just going to start working through that committee and ultimately to the Title 21 Parts and Planning Zoning Commission. Um, so those are those are some highlights. This is keeping me busy. Uh, secure trash regulation is not uh, off by the chart, but I have really done much apologies why you know, you know. anyway that's highlights here for questions if you got them. I have a, a specific question about the the proposed changes that come from administration for title 21 I heard you mention that in um, I think the assembly last week's assembly meeting as well and I couldn't find anything written down anywhere in any of the documents is that information available what the list it of proposals is, are. Yeah, if you, if you go to muni.org, click on assembly, go to assembly committees, and then go to the website for the Community and Economic Development Committee, that, that is, it's like a one page sheet. Okay, I couldn't find it last week, but I will I look again. I think to see it was posted a few days ago. Okay. If you can't find it, email me and I'll make sure it gets Thanks. posted. But I recall being posted, but it's not on the list. Any other questions for Mr. Weddleton? Actually, I got yeah. one. John, um, you said you're on the, the homeless committee, um, or subcommittee there for the assembly. When, when you're planning, I, I know in Anchorage, it, there's it's, there's a, a lot more folks that you know are homeless, but I, I would assume you, you keep the smaller communities in mind and and keep those discussions up, you know, Girdwood or Tugac or, you know, ones that may not have the numbers that you'd see in downtown Anchorage, but it, it still does occur. Yeah, no, I appreciate the reminder, actually, um, because, you know, the focus is largely on do we have a facility large enough for the number we anticipate? And um, so that affects everywhere, but yeah, if it's located in the heart of Anchorage, it does make it a challenge for um, people in that line of communities, so, though. You know, we do have people, you know, people from Seward and Homer and other places, but they're homeless. In those towns, they say, you ought to go to Anchorage. So, um, our, our, that line of communities involved with our homeless situation are very far along. Thank you. Any other and, questions? And actually, you know, if you have ideas, too, uh, send them my way, you know, on how we would do it. Because I think one would be transportation. Um, do we get navigators out to Girdwood? So that is, um, I have your thoughts on that too. Sure, thanks. Great, thank you. Thank you for coming to the meeting, Mr. Weddleton. Yeah, I'll be hanging out there. Okay. All right, moving on to number four, APL Garish Library Report. Is Jamie White here? She's not, but she submitted a written report. Okay. I did see that in the package. It's in the package. So everyone can refer to that for number four. Moving on to number five, Girdwood Service Area Report. Kyle? Yeah, and I'll give, uh, I'll try to keep this brief. Um, uh, our seasonal employees, Andrew and Brian, have been out there doing a great job uh, at, currently. And if you're up there, they are working on the reroute of the Virgin Creek Trail at the trailhead. Uh, currently, that trailhead's on private property, and that property is being developed for a residence. And so they are uh, starting the process of moving that trail up there. And uh, uh, we just want to give a notice that next week, uh, the trail will be closed along with the upper portion of uh, Timberline Road because that new property is going to be tapping into um, their uh, water service. So, um, so that will temporarily close it for a few days, um, but uh, at some point in time we'll be switching over to the new trailhead um, up there in that area. Uh, there, as always, our most 
obviously all our fields, parks, and trails are all open and for use out there and, and ready to go. It's kind of the best time of year with conditions um, before we fall into fall here. Uh, the Guru Trails uh, Master Plan Subcommittee uh, will continue its work here at the next meeting in September, right before the uh, uh, trails meeting, uh, the normally scheduled trails meeting, and um, they'll be uh, talking about reviewing the comments, the public comment period coming in, so uh, uh, that will happen at that point in time. And uh, we are currently working with the Mole family on getting signs for the new dedicated uh, baseball field over there for Slade and Mole. So we hope to have those signs up here uh, before winter hits. Um, uh, his family is working on designing them as we speak. So, And uh, the nonprofit grant cycle is currently um, it is open uh, and uh, applications um, are through open till the middle of September so people can apply for nonprofit grants, GBOS nonprofit grants and then there will be a presentation October 19th uh, for those who have applied for a, a grant uh, at 7 p.m. in this room. Uh, in our packet here we list all the current status of our several grants that we are working with and looking to apply to uh, in the near future as we move forward there. And as always Margaret does a great job keeping our social media and website up. Uh, switching gears into roads, um, uh, the Allberg repave uh, and guardrail and uh, drainage improvements has been completed. Um, the project went really well and uh, we are just now in the final stages of uh, dealing with some of the expenses and the negotiations between the contractor and the MOA uh, to complete that so we'll be wrapping that up shortly um, but that road should be in better shape uh, than it has been for about 20 years so uh, that's taken care of. Uh, this otherwise no other major project updates at this time um, we're just doing general grading and uh, we'll be applying some calcium that we had uh, left over from our original stockpile uh, to harden up the roads and hopefully get us through uh, this fall as we've turned into the fall weather now. Um, update our undesignated fund balance at this time for the, uh, the Gerwood service area is $298,000 um, and that was audited on June 24th so we're current on that and uh, for July we made, we paid an invoice of 42000 to Western Construction for the road maintenance out there and that included uh, pro paving two approaches. Uh, we'll have a fairly large bill in August as we make the final payment on the Allberg um, up there so that will show up in uh, next month's bill uh, there and so so far we spent the 356,000 with them of the 700,000 budgeted uh, our public works uh, budget overall we've only used 44 percent at this time um, and we have a reserve of 326,000 for a capital account for roads uh, for parks we've used 23 percent um, one thing to keep in mind with parks two of our largest expenditure is our contribution that we'll be pulling from our, our operating budget and putting into our capital reserve um, which will be 150,000 and then the money that we pay out for grants um, that's another large portion so once those two get paid then we'll, we'll use up a good portion of our parks budget along with the rest of our remaining work for the summer uh, we have a capital reserve of 586,000 right now in parks and a, a reserve for this room of $74,000 in our police expenditures, as of right now, we have spent 49% of our budget. We just actually paid, so we're just over uh, a little bit there, but we're right on uh, pace for um, being within budget this year for that budget. And then for our fire, uh, we have paid out 77% of our budget, and that's because the Gerwood Fire Department, as a nonprofit, takes, um, they get their full payment upfront now instead of quarterly. So in the first quarter, they get their full payment for the year. Um, so that, that's why that budget looks high and they have an undesignated account right now of 359000 So that's uh, my report. Questions? I have a comment rather than a question. Amongst the, uh, all the great work, the one thing I'd like to particularly call out is the uh, new calendar we have um, on GBOS. There's actually a link. I think there's a link in the report there. Um, so muni.org GBOS slash events. Yes, so Margaret figured out with her right here. Oh. 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 Where am I? Oh. Right here? Oh, there, okay. At the very top. Yep. So. Um, so you can see all the different GBOS and all its subcommittees and uh, things like that. So 
and then go to one spot there. It's a, it's a, a much easier, cleaner. All the information is on the fold on the other website. This is much easier if you're just looking for meetings. Correct. And I think each of those links to the agenda, doesn't it? The agenda and the location. A week out, I populated well, week out, with the yes. yeah. agenda. Yeah. It is not intuitive. It doesn't update the agenda if we update the agenda. So okay. uh, if you find errors, let me know and I'll fix them. Thank you. I think that's a, a, a much easier way of seeing some of the. Um, yeah, I'm glad you pointed out. Data. What it looks like. You got a question? Question from Jerry. Uh, we're going to do some offerings to the light uh, the uh, striping is still going to try to get completed uh, this year, but the other asphalt um, upgrades to the bike path, the administration had a different idea for the use of that money, and so uh, that was a sort of a last minute pitch from the previous administration, and so that has changed at this point in time. So. So we're not doing those upgrades this summer, but we're going to try to include those next year. Uh, and the upgrades to the bike path would be for the bike path to the resort from Alberg, uh, Alieska Highway intersection, and then the bike path to um, the uh, school, because those are within the service area. Uh, the uh, inlaid lines out there on the swoops, um, we thought we had a different funding source, but now we're back to working with our funding. and. Uh, We'll try to get that completed this year with our contractor. We pay it up front and then this DOT reimburses us. From the Alaska Highway improvements. Yeah. So that's where they reimburse us. So. So, okay, so there's yeah. No yeah, it got a bit complicated with some CARES Act funding this year, and then that CARES Act funding fell through. So we've been trying to reappropriate the money so we can get projects done. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, just follow up on that. I didn't completely understand. Are you saying the the money that came from DOT for reimbursement of the flashing lights is not? The right it's available. Cost? It's available. We had something going on with CARES Act funding where we were trying to use the CARES Act funding first to okay. do that project right. and use that funding for other sources, but uh, with the new administration that CARES Act funding changed and um, and so we are going through with the DOT. The problem is I have to pay it up front out of my operating budget, so I have to get through all the buildings on the Alberg yes. and all that because we had such a strong winter that my operating budget is very yep. tight, so I got to make sure there's money there to pay it, then we can get that reimbursed from the state, and we still have enough money okay. to do plowing in October, November, December. So the money's still available, it's a mechanism to get to that money. It's a mechanism that we have to pay it first and then get reimbursed from the Understood. state, and the state can take almost sometimes six months to reimburse. So it's a balance of trying to make it all work. Thank you. If not, we'll do next group. Okay, Kyle, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Number six, then, Imagine Girdwood, officer update. I think Amanda is going to take this. Yep, um, thank you. So, Imagine Girdwood's going well. We are moving on to phase three, our technical analysis with Huddle. Um, this is first starting with a suitability study, land suitability study, and they presented on that last week. And um, we've been working on our bylaws and are going to be going over the draft I think, next week um, and talking about fundraising to help uh, fund Huddle help with the rest of the plan. We're going to be discussing uh, future meeting locations. So we're currently online still, and uh, whether or not, and that ends this month, um, and we'll make a decision for future meetings. Other than that, we are probably going to discuss Holton Hills and the Elias Village de development proposal, and keep keep plugging forward. Can I get it done? One thing I would add is the our uh, regular meetings are on the fourth Wednesday of the month, except this month, due to a conflict with uh, our um, contractor. Uh, it's being moved to Monday the 23rd, so it's going to be two days earlier than usual. 
uh, that's on our website and uh, we'll be sending an email around to our email list to inform everybody. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Moving on to number seven, supervisor reports. Public safety, Jennifer. Uh, I'll be quick. The main thing that public safety is working on is looking at the police contract. Uh, that is not an automatic thing. It needs to uh, be, uh, sorry, it runs out in 17 months and there are two possible one-year extensions, but it's uh, going to take, I think, both diplomacy and negotiation to figure out if that's best for both communities to uh, continue that and also it's going to take some renegotiation so anyone who's interested in that should get their voice involved. Okay, thank you. Uh, is the chief online police report with your public safety director Andre Achi? Ache? Rather? Yes, um, I'm here. Um, with public safety, this is a huge moment in the current area where it's a trainer after it's on a traffic enforcement in the Timberline area. All these guys are way up to the Road and Albert, uh, as well as Crow Creek Road. Um, officers have been doing quite a few uh, traffic stops in that area in the Timberline based on the Timberline, so it's a concern to people to be the announced around the Timberline area. Other than that, it's a business as usual. Um, nothing major going on. Um, it's not trainer after it's uh, in the current area. Could you say the last sentence one more time, please? Oh, just concentrating on that. There's a traffic in that Concentrating their efforts on traffic. Got it. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Anything else? Okay. Thank you for coming to the meeting and giving us your report, uh, police and safety report. PSAC representative. No. Okay. Roads and utilities, Amanda? Yeah, I don't have much to report. I did notice that um, El Pipeto and I think LISW got some um, upkeep done today with like some grading and some calcium was laid. So thank you, Western and Kyle. Um, and that's all I got. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Parks and Recreation Cemetery. I will be brief. Kyle touched on Virgin Creek and that update as well as behind this is an update from Girdwood Trails Committee representative here tonight. So what I found for volunteer opportunities is coming up this Saturday. The Alaska Trails website is Alaska hyphen trails.org and they have a volunteer opportunity coming up from for brushing the bird to gird bike path so that is very close to all of us and probably would be great for anyone to volunteer and help just go to the website to find out what time or maybe the locations uh, I'll let Barb talk about the Gerber Trails Committee Cemetery no update so Barb you're here um, let's see, Kyle talked about the Virgin Creek, but there's the, also the Ruani Trail connection to the Lower Iditarod that is going to be uh, worked on this fall uh, using RTP money that he still has. And Trails Committee passed a motion to support the improvement of that connector trail. Uh, we also worked on the uh, Board of Supervisors gave us the advice we were looking for on the flow chart about uh, the trail approval process and when we had a question about how it worked with land use versus trails and so we're going to rework our graphic that will go in the trails management plan and the trails master plan that reflects the fact that land use and trails committee will both advance their recommendations to gbos and they may have different opinions and then i guess it's up to you so we'll work on that um we started working on our operating procedures and reviewing those and i worked with 
uh, Kaylee on that. And we presented a draft of our proposed updates as new business. And that's in our, our meeting packet. And that will be discussed at this meeting in September and hopefully updated. Uh, most of what we did was uh, adding things in that I got inspired by reading the GBOS operating procedures. And there's various situations that have come up in trails meetings this year um, where we really noticed a lack of direction in our own operating procedures. So this will be very helpful. Uh, let's see, the other thing we did is we uh, passed a motion recommending that the Girdwood Valley Service Area seek funding for engineering and design of a suspension bridge to cross Glacier Creek. Um, so to try and move that plan forward. And finally, there was a presentation from the Girdwood Mountain Bike, except they're not Girdwood Mountain Bike Alliance anymore, and I, I'm, you learn one name and then you never learn the new one. Bikewood. Bikewood. Okay, so Bikewood uh, is concerned about the fact that there are a lot of funding opportunities available right now and that they are missing out on those opportunities. They cannot apply for grants because at this point they, they don't have a letter of support. So Nick uh, mentions past history how we had, had passed a resolution of support, but at that point GBOS was looking for the master plan to give the whole community direction but now that master plan has been in the works for a year and a half, two years, and they have not been able to jump on any of these grants. They're hoping that maybe their trail bike park concept can get approved and move forward while all this money is now available before everybody else jumps the line on them. So that still needs to be discussed. That was new business, so... We'll work on that some more. That's all I have. Any questions? Great. Thank, Thank you. you, Barb. Thank you. Okay, sorry, looking at Girdwood Trails Plan Subcommittee Report. Any comments on that, Kyle? Uh, no, they will be just discussing it further at, uh, before the next GBOS meeting, or next Girdwood Trails Committee meeting. Okay. And fire department, Guy. Yeah, thanks. Um, as Jennifer mentioned earlier, we've been reviewing budgets and fires. Um, one that's up there with the roads and utilities. It's, it's a bit more complex, though, so it's um, getting me up to speed. I appreciate you know Kyle's help and Michelle's help on that. But I would urge anybody if. Um, as you review these budgets, if you're looking at the fire budget, um, there are separate funding sources and there's two separate, you know, there's fire and EMS and, and so it's just a bit more complex. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me um, and then I can find the answer for you or point you in the right direction. But. Okay, great. Chief, for update of Gerwood Fire Department. There, Michelle Wilson, Fire Chief. Um, a few things uh, of note. Uh, we have had, uh, in as of July, 287 calls. Uh, and in July, we had uh, four fire calls, 31 EMS calls, and then 21 calls that we call good service, good intent, or false alarms. Uh, we had one mutual aid, which was that SAR, uh, with, uh, search and rescue, uh, with the Alaska State Troopers. And then AFD provided coverage for us three times. So that's when they came down and covered our service area because we were out on uh, calls that took all our staffing away. Um, uh, you probably want to know what's happening with the contract. Um, I went last Wednesday and talked to uh, the municipal manager and uh, Chief One, Chief Trogi, about the importance of funding our contract and what would happen if they did not. 
provide the funding that we were told we were getting this year, um, that extra 300000 to the contract, and they both assured me that, no, the fire department will move forward and you will get the funding. Um, so that seemed like a positive step, uh, and but I have not seen the final contract yet. But I'm thinking positively after that experience. And uh, the municipal manager was very warm and welcoming and had me in her office, and uh, that was lovely. Um, we mentioned the staffing with uh, Senior Captain Olson retiring. Uh, and then uh, we have the hose purchase on uh, today, uh, later on um, on the agenda. Um, any questions? We've got uh, engineer class going on. This is when we've got the, everybody that came in earlier. Um, they're learning how to pump the apparatus and drive apparatus. And then we're also possibly, oh, the chief's coming back on, possibly supporting Whittier police on something uh, also this evening. Um, so, uh, questions for fire? A couple of questions. Um, what is the number, the, the general number of volunteers staff? How does that look at the moment? Um, we're holding steady around 35 with, with people that are off, right? There's a lot of people that are off. We probably won't take anybody this fall. We're going to just wait till January. What's been happening is when we take people in fall, AFD then offers letters in December. So we'll just have them start and then they'll disappear again. So, uh, so we're going to wait until uh, January to do the, the new hire just because um, it, doing them, you know, every time we do them in fall, we lose two or three people that we've invested some time in. So. Uh, so that's kind of where we are right now. Um, if we had every, if we had all positions that were fully done with paid uh, part-time people or who were volunteering their time, uh, we would need 62 people who never took any vacations or any time off. So that would be the magic number, would be 62. Um, but it's hard to get 62, right? People have life and life happens. And uh, a number, as, uh, as things happen, a number of people have also got opportunities to go work elsewhere uh, for professional departments. That's happening right now too. Uh, so um, it is what it is. We train people up to do well and then everybody sort of poaches them and they go on to a fabulous career. So. So at so uh, some level, it's a success. It's successful. Everybody wants to hire a girl to fire people, which is wonderful. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, it doesn't serve for longevity. Um, I think one of the things I've found uh, in Alaska and also in Lower 48 is all of the former like volunteer departments are all now combination departments where they have they can't volunteerism can't staff the fire departments anymore, and so they have to have a certain component of paid people. And part and part time people, which is where we are. Which is where we are. So we're right where everybody else is, unfortunately. My second question, totally disconnected, to that is, um, what's the situation with uh, burn permits and things like that? So uh, burn permits, you have to call. Uh, the burn permits are not. Um, controlled by us. So it might seem that we're being awful and telling you to put out a fire, but it, that's actually not controlled by us. We are conduits for uh, Anchorage Fire Department fire prevention. And so the number to call every day changes, 267-5020. The number stays the same. Number it, stays the same. Yeah. It might change due to wind and everything. Right. Uh, they, they look at the indices and it changes. Um, and then um, there are no actually burn permits. It's just, is it a burn day? Okay. And then there's some regulations no. you have to follow for that day. And is that um, decision based on the weather conditions in Anchorage Bowl? They're supposed to look at the municipality in the whole. Okay. Do they? Your They're opinion? supposed to look at the municipality in the whole. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it's been a long debate. Um, uh, 15 years ago when I was in a the AFD Forester, um, we talked, we had a rod station here, we talked about doing specialized burning, right? Why are we in a rainforest? Why can't we burn when it's raining, right? Yeah. Um, the other day we had to ask somebody very nicely to put out a fire when it was raining, um, but uh, we lost that fight, the rod station came out, and uh, yeah. That may be the, the thing I was mentioned, somebody mentioned to me as well. Yeah, but there yeah. There are definitely I, cases I, where it's where right. you told you cannot burn when it's literally burning. Um, plus, if you look at the burn regulations, you know, it's supposed to be a foot off the ground, certain wide, certain height, and a lot of us have been, you know, we've had little campfires on the ground, but they're actually supposed to be a foot off the ground, you know, so, so there's actually regulations on how it's supposed to be. We don't always follow, you know, not if you go into Walmart or um, Lowe's and buy a, um, a chimney or something that might not meet the intent of what the burn regulations are. Um, they may be selling things that don't fit the intent of what a burn uh, device should be. So 
it is kind of what it is. Um, and then, uh, and then for me, as you know, um, I'm supporting uh, AKIMT1, uh, the incident management team. So um, I am. Uh, we were down in Oregon on the bootleg fire. Uh, the team went Sunday to Monument Fire. I'm supporting virtually till Match gets back in town, but I will be going back out again on Thursday. Um, I really appreciate the rain here. Um, uh, having just heard on a teleconference about uh, a number of communities that we're going to evacuate in the next couple days that are probably going to lose our homes, um, it really makes, uh, you know, it really brings home how lucky we are to live here. So, um, yeah. So, uh, any questions? Uh, COVID, COVID's also super happening right now, right? So COVID, uh, hospital's still on rotation. Um, everybody's very tired of COVID at this point in time, but uh, we're just sort of moving through it, so. Questions? Yes. I'm wondering about your current team that you have right now. Do you see people having housing challenges and do you see that as playing a part in the Yes, yes, Helen Joe, uh, it's totally different than, uh, so I mentioned Matt Wilson was here when I start. you know, we started both like 23, well, 25, 24 years ago. It was totally different. All of the fire department, at the, when I started, lived in Girdwood. And everybody was able to volunteer and have other jobs and come out and, and help out, right? Uh, now, because of the cost of housing, and you know, there was a lot of houses that were converted to Airbnbs, and you know, that sort of changed everything. Uh, there isn't the availability of housing for people that people can afford. And if people are here uh, working, they might also be working two jobs to try and be able to afford their house here, right? So there isn't that number of people that can volunteer there. Um, of the, I recently told NPR when they called that of the, um, you know, you've got to think people in that, uh, uh, not me, obviously, I'm too old, but uh, most people in the fire department are right in that, hey, we're establishing our life, we're getting our career, you know, we're going to buy a house. Um, I know of seven, eight people who, you know, everybody's getting married. I know of eight people who have firefighters that have bought houses outside of the community. Uh, it's not that they didn't want to live here, they just can't afford to live here. And then I would say right now we're hovering at probably 75% of firefighters uh, living in Girdwood. Uh, everybody else living outside. Uh, it, there's more people probably outside at this point than inside Girdwood, and that's a challenge, right? And so um, if you're asking everybody to donate 48 hours a, a month uh, of uh, being on call and not paying them, but then when they do go on a call, they get 11 bucks an hour, um, it doesn't even cover gas, because you might come down and cover your six-hour shift and never go on a call. So we're kind of relying on people's goodwill to want to get that education and experience and support the community through that. But it's not, it's not um, sustainable. Right. And that's why you look at other departments that all have raised up their cost of what they pay people um, and switched to different models. Sorry, can you repeat the, your, your estimate of your current percentage that are living outside? I would say 60, 60. We were at, we were at 60 before, but I've had a couple people leave, so I'd have to recheck re it, but it's probably like 60% or 50-50. It was a lot more people. I was really shocked. One of the things that wasn't disclosed when I took the job was how many people didn't live in the community. Mm -hmm. And so uh, how that translates is in the middle of the night when we have to roll out, you know, I'll roll out because we, I need, I'm trying to maintain a minimum staffing level of six people on a call, and so uh, there isn't that depth of people, but it, what it means is the Gerber people kind of get burnt out, right, because they're putting in their 48 hours, but then they're also the ones that are always here rolling on calls. So, so you see a lot of people are tired, and that's the Gerber people especially are more tired because they're going on more calls because they're here, and it's really hard to sit at home when you know, bad things are happening on the highway. So I would say, I would say, I, I will go and double check the number, but because I want to give you the most accurate number, um, but it has been moving around, right? So, and it's, yeah, and it's hard, it's hard given a transient population, because everybody's like, well, just get out of 
take the ski people that are just here for ski season. Well, it's really hard to train somebody to a certain level, have their skills good, and then say, okay, I'm not going to see you for six months and come back. I mean, that's hard. We have taken in a couple people that had previous skills that were really good, um, but for people that aren't around a lot, it's hard to keep maintain skills. Does that answer your question? It does. Can I do one quick one? Sure. In an ideal world, if you could say, I could, in order to supplement my volunteer, it would be helpful if I had X amount of housing units available for first responders. What would that number be? Ten. Ten to twenty. Well, it, you know, 10 at least would be lovely, right, to start. So we have a, so we have, ideally, we have 50 people that we try and carry, um, you know, but a number of people those off, that's why I come down to 35, right? Um, but, you know, 50, again, I'd love it to be 62, but realistically, I can't find 62 people. So, um, you know, I think 10 would be a great start. Okay. And something affordable versus unaffordable. So even, even my, the people that I have that are on staff, sort of full-time, basically, they all live in Anchorage. So, just because they can't afford it. Okay. Okay, thank you, Chief Watson. Okay. Land use. Mike. Okay, um, so one general item of land use and then uh, move on to some specifics. So, um, one general item was there was a um, at the HLB advisory committee meeting last month. Um, there was an item of, for um, a parcel of land along Seward Highway, um, basically to the to the east of um, well, just around and mostly to the east of Glacier Creek, um, all the way to the ponds, um, which they uh, they intend to move to. Um, or dispose of effectively by uh, moving it to a land trust, to create land trust. Um, and that, that passed uh, the advisory committee. I think it's still, I'm not sure if it has to go through the assembly or not, but uh, it may still have to go to the assembly before it's finished. Um, I don't know, John is on, he may know. Um, that was one item that, that uh, didn't come through the local community at all. That was just done uh, purely with an HLB. Um, the, yeah, that's it. The other items are land use. There was no land use meeting this month. Uh, it got cancelled. There was, um, I think, only one item, um, and it was a presentation. It wasn't an item for business. Um, we will be having a land use meeting uh, in September. Um, update on housing working group. We had the housing working group last week, and we focused primarily on um, the issues around short-term rentals, so Airbnbs, etc. Um, and uh, we reviewed some of the approaches to um, putting in uh, permitting regulations. Um, and the dissent to the meeting was just go away and draft something and then discuss it. So that's the plan. So we'll uh, we'll have a draft for a recommended, or at least one recommendation, and then we can discuss that more broadly in the community once we have something specific in front of us. Great, thank you. Any questions for Mike? All right, public comment. Persons offering public comment must state their full name and address. Public comment is limited to three minutes per person and must be on subjects not listed on the agenda. Please come on up. You may. It's just uh, well, the radio we for the radio, the microphone's up there, and you can move it down or up. You don't have to touch it. You can pick it up. It's fine where it is. Okay, thank you. It's fine where it is, she said. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Connie Yoshimura, and I am part of the group that won the RFP with the Heritage Land Bank for development. The other participants in the RFP was Pomeroy Lodging and Seth Anderson, who is also here tonight. I wanted to come this evening to tell you who the principals were uh, in the RFP because I have heard that there has been some other issues that have been raised. So um, as to who might be uh, participants in another way. So I just want to reassure this group and any member of the public that we are the three principals that won the RFP. Uh, 
Nagy, and there are no other individuals that are involved at that level. So I have brought uh, for you uh, uh, printed copies of the RFP because if you're like me, you maybe find it easier to read and take notes if you have a piece of paper in front of you. So I'm happy to pass these out uh, to everyone and suggest that um, the first page is probably the most important as it relates to the matter that I addressed to you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Mike, I think you already have I one. Have so right? many. But I do have several copies for anyone who would like it in print. Thank you. Thank you. It's so much easier to read. <laughs> rules and procedures and Girdwood Valley service area infrastructure to allow online hybrid public meetings. I can talk to this unless um, Margaret would like to do so. No. no. Okay. So um, about a year, over a year ago, we made a change to our operating procedures um, to add a, a condition or a clause in there for, um, or a section I should say, um, for holding meetings online. And uh, we, made the, we made the assumption that um, if there was a major health issue, there would be a, a state of emergency either declared at the state level or the municipal level. And in fact, there was a, um, a proclamation of health emergency um, at the municipal level. So that was a mechanism that triggered the ability for us to uh, have purely online meetings. Um, obviously, since then, case rates decreased. Um, things got a lot, bit, a lot better. The municipal proclamation disappeared, um, or we've got rescinded. Um, as things have got worse again with Delta, um, we haven't seen a municipal pro proclamation, and we don't expect it, and we don't expect anything from the state either. So, to acknowledge that, um, you know, sometimes our local, uh, our local leadership may not be quite as responsive as others, um, I added in one clause that says if there's a federal public health emergency, again, which recommends um, either makes in-person attendance uh, not recommended on difficult or not feasible, uh, then we can again trigger online meetings. Um, so that's the first part. Um, and a few words have moved around because they got put in the sub clause by mistake. Um, there's a mechanism for actually triggering that, which is either the chair or co-chairs that we had before, or a majority vote of members. We have an extra way of triggering it um, if that condition applies. Um, the cleanup of language in section now section C, and uh, one other additional um, termination condition. So uh, two-thirds vote of membership can, um, if it's possible to hold. Uh, legally to hold in-person meetings, a two-thirds vote of uh, the members of the board can uh, move us back to that state, so we don't have to wait for a um, public health declaration to end to change it back. We may choose to, but we don't have to. So this is kind of a clean-up of, uh, of the procedure for moving to online meetings and not. And uh, practically what this would mean is when we, have, when we make these changes, which would, cannot be at tonight's meeting, we have to uh, 
I think we can we can publicize that we intend to make these changes, um, but we would have to do it after 30 days of um, having these changes in public. Um, once these changes are made, and if we choose to, we could, uh, under current conditions, we could actually move back to online meetings. Uh, I have heard from many people um, who basically don't want to come to in-person meetings at the moment um, due to the increase in Delta, due to the, although Girdwood overall has, seems to have a very, very high vaccination rate. I think we're um, one of the top two or three in the state. Um, there are still plenty of people who are, where the vaccination state is unknown. We obviously have a lot of, uh, nobody under 12, and a lot of children don't, don't have vaccinations. So uh, there is definitely concern amongst many uh, people in the community. And I think it's a, a mistake if we, um, if we end up with public meetings where people are effectively excluded. Um, so moving to, moving back to online may solve that. It doesn't solve everything, but that's a possibility. So this change in um, operating procedure will at least give us a mechanism where we could move back to online if we choose to in the future. Hey, Guy. Yeah, I got a question, Mike. Um, I'm familiar with the, you know, the state, our state, um, of emergency or municipal proclamation, but, and I'll do my homework on this, but a federal public health emergency. Are we actually in one now, or kind yes. of what, what is the... We're actually in two. There are two, there are two, um, the Department of Health and Social Security, uh, Social Services, sorry, um, uh, does the declaration of public health emergency, and there are two at the moment. Um, one is for the opioid e epidemic, but that's not about communicative diseases, so it has no, because of the second clause, that um, it would have to have an impact on attendance meetings, that doesn't. Um, and the first one, of course, is COVID. So that actually started in February, I believe, last year. So basically, if we have to wear a mask on a plane, then we're probably under that. It's, it, it, provides, it provides a triggering mechanism where we can decide on, locally, we can decide whether it justifies a move to, um, a move to online meetings or not. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. yes. Go ahead, Jennifer. Um, Kyle, we had, I, I had uh, not maybe pursued this as much with you as I should have, um, because I understood that there, we had this legal opinion that the way our bylaws are written, um, we, we can't just plain choose it. Uh, I guess my concern about the changes to this is that, that we're still assuming that, that any reason we would want to switch to um, online meetings would be connected to public health. But I didn't get that impression from our survey, which I think we would need to do again, but I would like to see us have the right to decide that what we want is to meet, or, or that if the, if the Girdwood community wants to meet online, I think we should have that right completely separate from whether or not there's a health emergency. People have so many other reasons, like wanting to be able to have a life at the same time, or having childcare issues, or just like so many things. Maybe we do, maybe we don't, but I'd like to have the right to do that without it having been connected. The way this is written right now, we're still under K to get to F. And so if we're gonna change this, I would like to see it not under K. <laughs> Are you saying you disagree with this, or you want more than this? I want more than this. Right. So we can still accept this and do more? Right, we, yes. But, but I also feel like um, this doesn't really address the questions I've had from the get-go on this is, if Gerd would want Zoom, could we go back to Zoom? Completely separate, different, and unconnected to public health emergencies. Right. Uh, because it all this gets all this gets gooey, right? So I'd like to get away from the gooey. Kind of. <laughs> right. Because in the meanwhile, we still would like to discuss the possibility of hybrid meetings and that old business every meeting until we can come up with something as a board and as uh, municipal employees too. Uh, I am in support of these changes and for the health and safety of our community. I think it provides participation much better. And those are my
my comments so far. And for the other subcommittees also. Can I just say one other thing? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Amanda. I, I just wanted to voice my support for this. Um, I like having another AMP avenue to um, be able to do virtual meetings. I think it's important. Thank you, Amanda. Jennifer, did you have one? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify too that I'm, I'm interested in this committee having the possibility of online meetings without having to solve the hybrid issue. So I kind of want to be clear about that because it's it's been it seems clear to me that we can't uh, solve that problem in the same way that Anchorage has solved that problem. That it's different for us than for Anchorage, and so I think we can kind of separate ourselves from. I would like to see us be able to separate ourselves from kind of what Anchorage is doing, or what the mayor is declaring, or what the feds are declaring, and just kind of decide as a community. I would like us to have the freedom to decide that we want to be online, or we want to pursue hybrid, or whatever. But this doesn't. This to, to me, this is. A baby step, but I, I, I guess I'm kind of wondering why so many baby steps instead of like. It seems to me there's another way to solve this problem, and I'm not sure why we're doing it this way. I think the um, I, I like, really like the idea of redoing the survey. I think that's a good idea. So we should we should probably do it in a um, you know, independently of health and safety. Just say. You know, we've done this and we've experimented it for this for reason A, but you know, independently of that, is this the way the community wants to go in the future? I think that's a good idea. I think that's a that's a parallel with this work. I think this work is narrowly tailored. It doesn't open up broader questions of whether we want to do it long term or not. It's just a a, a pragmatic um, solution to that. Uh, we can use the framework though. Um, and you know, steal a few bits of wording for a more general thing if that's the way the community wants to go. But I think we can do the two things in parallel. So we do the, we do the survey um, without the health and safety aspects of it. Just what's the right long-term solution, and then in parallel go through this process. Okay. I would just like to just get some clarification from staff. What do we actually do with this um, now? Because we have to have this 30-day notice period. Well, now you've posted it. We have to. These changes are posted. You presented it. We have to wait the 30 days. Okay. And then, so we, so we just table it to next month. Table till next month. Okay. Make sure within the 30-day window, and then uh, yep, you can vote. You can decide to vote on it at that point in time. Okay. So I'll make a motion that we um, we rediscuss this again at the next meeting. Second. We'll table it to the next meeting. I second the motion. Roll call. I just want a table. That's good. And then, can I ask a follow-up question on that? Sure. Uh, just, uh, is there anything we need to do, what, or what do we need to do to make that survey happen? To make the change so that you can just have meetings online? No, I'm sorry. It sounded like Mike's suggestion was that we do another community we survey. Another survey. I think. Yeah, I agree with you, Jim. Oh. Well, we could reproduce what we did. You know, I would want to run it by you for for confirmation you're fine with the questions. So I could bring that forward to the next meeting if you like, and we can go over that and then get the survey out. So Do that's you, what you were saying. Would right? it something, is this something you'd be interested in, where we can probably the two of us can work with Kyle to come up with something great. we can present next meeting? Yeah, sure. I'd love to like actually move forward with this and kind of separate ourselves out from whatever else. Anchorage wants to do. Right. Okay, great. That'd be great, Jennifer. Do we need a roll call, Kyle, or no? No, no. I think we're good. Okay, great. Anything else? Okay, number nine, agenda item LUC 2016-05, housing working group request for land use recommendation for GBOS resolution of support for HLV to prioritize allocation of a percentage of attainable housing in the agreement for HLV parcel 6-011, 6 6016, and 6017, area commonly known as Fulton Hills. 
Okay, so this came from Housing Working Group um, quite a while back, and it worked its way through our local process. Um, I know that the discussions are, you know, the agreement discussions are ongoing now, and this may or may not be too late, but it's pleased to say it's a formal statement. Um, we have a resolution here, um, which I will read into the record, and then I'm going to make an amendment to it. Um, I will do this now. So this is kind of I'm proposing a motion by reading the resolution. So resolution 2021-18, resolution of support for allocation of percentage of obtainable housing in the agreement for disposal of Heritage Land Bank, which will be parcels 6011, 6016, and 6017. Whereas Girdwood residents and area businesses are struggling to find housing that is affordable within the community, while many existing homes here are not over-occupied and may be used as investment properties for short-term and nightly rental, and whereas the community has identified that the need to provide attainable housing for those who live and raise families here is integral to our community's future, and whereas Girdwood Land Use Committee and Girdwood Board of Supervisors have heard concerns regarding housing from the community and responded with implementing the Girdwood Housing Working Group, which was established in 2018 to review the housing situation and seek solutions to make more achievable housing options available in Girdwood. And whereas while many of the options identified by the Housing Working Group are reactive in nature, such as code changes regarding accessory dwelling units and possible regulation for short-term rentals, there are opportunities to be found in proactive effort to provide for this need in new construction projects, and whereas recent requests for proposals for HLB parcels 611, 616 and 617 has resulted in the selection of Pomeroy Property Development Limited as the preferred proposal, and whereas potential disposal of this land to Pomeroy Property Development Limited provides an opportunity to include attainable housing targeted to meet the needs of work Force and family housing for the community as a whole, as well as employees of Alieska Resort. And whereas the Housing Working Group and the Gerber Land Use Committee have requested that the Gerber Board of Supervisors make this request for a percentage of attainable housing, in addition to Alieska Resort employee housing, be included in the agreement for disposal of the HLB parcels under consideration. And whereas the Land, Land Goodwood and the Land Use Committee supported this request by a vote of 15 in favour, zero opposed, and three abstaining. Therefore, the Good Report supervises the result support for HLB to prioritise allocation of the percentage of table housing in addition to employee housing to be included in the agreement for HLB parcels 611, 616, and 617, parcel approved, etc. I second the motion. And do you have the amendment? I have two things I want to amend. The, the first is um, I may seek some advice from the audience on this. Um, this says the selection of Pomeroy Property Development Limited, and I don't think that's the, the right term. I think it's, it's broader than that. I don't know if there's, is there a term being used for the for the group which is uh, is currently under negotiation in negotiations with HLB? There's not currently in the terms of that. The RFP speaks to three people, including the three entities, including Okay. So, what, what would be the? Is there a more accurate term when we say who who was selected? Um, I would just at this particular point in time to say the way proposal, the entity that would. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. For the wedding okay, right. Okay, so that's a kind of technical change just in the language. Um, the other thing I, I would like to uh, suggest as an amendment is to add one whereas, um, to say, whereas attainable housing refers to housing, which is a purchase price which is attainable for households with incomes in the range of 80 to 120% of annual median income, or annualized median income. So that actually defines what attainable housing means in this context. Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, <clears throat> whereas attainable housing refers to housing which has a purchase price which is attainable to households with incomes in the range of 80 to 120 percent of annualized median income, or area annualized median income. Well, we 
could say AMI for good. Um, and I haven't been, I haven't been up to speed on this at the land use committees. Um, I, I'm assuming that these, you know, um, that this entity has been consulted with this, or has been, have they been at land use committees? And I, I don't think at land use committee because we didn't have a land use committee this month. But uh, I think the, the, this reflects the, the sort of general request from the community of. Uh, and I think the informal discussions with partnership as well, this seems to fall roughly in line with their intent. But again, what we're doing is asking, H asking HLP to include it. There's no, there's no force behind this, it's a general request. Okay, so. Question from Jerry? I have two comments. One, this is written as a um, I think the the way I say is this is a, a request to HLB to include um, to include the, the specific desire of the community in the final agreement. I don't know if the final agreement has been made or not, but um, it does acknowledge that there's a selection of the preferred proposal, but I don't believe an agreement has been signed for disposal. So we're requesting they include something in the um, in the disposal agreement to have a percentage is the word we came up with. We never came up with an actual percentage, but you know, a percentage of the table housing in the proposal. So I don't, I don't think it quite, I don't think it quite reads that um, the, the RFP is still open. I think it, I think it does read that there's been a selection, but the agreement isn't finalised. That's at least the intent. Okay. Now the next question is, you asked in your amendment to somehow get a number. So we are um, 
We're seconding the amendment or the resolution. Are we are we voting on this right now um, without the amendment added to it? And well, Kyle, you can answer. Well, it seems at this point Mike has made a motion to amend the resolution that he read, mm -hmm. and so he needs a second to amend the resolution. And if that passes, um, then you vote on the resolution as amended. If it fails, it goes back to the regular. Somebody can make a motion to accept the resolution as written, and then you can vote on that. Just to add one extra wrinkle, I believe the who, who seconded the original resolution was, was Brianna. That? Brianna, but she can't. So I think we probably need to somebody else to second that. Do you have that, that do text anywhere? Do you have that text anywhere written out? Only on a piece of paper. I can read it again. Would you please? Remember? Yeah, sure. Would it be possible to, to write this on the screen as I read it? Or I can give you my scribble and see if that helps. We're in PDF mode right now, so let me find it. Sorry. That's Thank okay. you. Chief Weston, were you stretching or did you have a question oh, no, for later? I'm excited about the project briefly, you know, having run by this where I like to plan resort communities, so I'm excited about it. And uh, I was just going to offer that, you know, uh, Canada, Vancouver does a lot of uh, asset additional, like, you know, putting the formal housing in that might be a spot to look at the language that comes from there um, that can incorporate and, uh, like, look at uh, North Vancouver. Uh, they have a lot of uh, affordable housing put into their development if you want to look at it. It is going to be midway up. Alright, I'm going to put you in the driver's seat here. <laughs> Since I can't really type very well with my left hand right now, I'm going to put Margaret over here. and You just tell her where you want to put these new whereas's and changes. Actually, I just love typing in front of
We were looking at making a so change I think the, to this. That, that term would be um, the entity which was suggested, the entity. Yep. For the winning proposal. Is what winning proposer? That's what Connie said. Proposal or proposer? Proposal. Proposal. AL. AL. Margaret may have written it down. Like that? And then I think in the previous thing we could just put add parts, maybe. After the meeting. This is almost as painful as I imagined. This must be great on the radio. You need a mouse, don't you? Sorry, I don't know why I'm not there. That's kind of an administrative change. Terrific. So maybe it can be done on the I love it. So we'll make that change as well. I don't know why I am there. <coughs> All right. So that mostly encompasses the changes. We'll just replace Pomeroy and the other one as well. Maybe I've lost track of where we are. Did we get a replacement second? So I'd entertain a motion to second the resolution 2021-18 and then second the resolution with amendments. I will second the uh, resolution with amendments. Amanda, can we have you just second it with the way that the resolution was originally written? Yeah, could you, what's in front of us right now is they're looking for somebody to second the resolution as written. Okay, I second the resolution. Okay, so now you guys are looking for a second to amend the resolution as now presented. Amend amend. So we're looking for a second on this changes. I'll second it. Okay. Thank you, Guy. And then any further discussion? So the, um, I'll, I'll say something briefly. So the purpose of the new language is just to, the, the, um, the statement we had had at least two, two sets of vaguenesses. One vagueness was it just says a percentage of, which is obviously not very specific. And the other thing is it uses the phrase attainable housing without any attempt to define it. So um, while we do not specify what percentage of housing we would like to be, a, um, we would like to be attainable, uh, so that gives some flexibility in what the agreement says. We do at least define what attainable means, which means you know twenty percent either side of the median annual annualized median income for good, median household income, I should say. Thank you for the clarification, Mike. Are we ready for a roll call? Sure. So this is a roll call on the, the resolution as amended. Brianna Sullivan. Could I stop for Sorry. a second? Sorry. Uh, I didn't ask one more time for public comment or question. Just trying to be quick here. And Jennifer, did you have Yeah, I did, I did. Just to clarify one more time. Yes. Uh, the potential disposal of this land to the entity for the winning proposal. This has already, this proposal has already succeeded. So to some extent, this is a retroactive request. I don't believe that's the case. My, my understanding, again, I'm, I, I, there's not much public information about what the status actually is. But my understanding is until the, um, while there are negotiations at the moment for what the agreement will be, until that's executed and goes through the full public process, it's not the full agreement which, which is actually in effect. So we still have opportunities to you know, make public comment on the process as it goes through um, HLB advisory committee 
and the Assembly. Um, and my understanding is there is still discussion at the moment on what the agreement between HLB and the developers is. So I think we still have an opportunity to at least make a formal request. So if that's not reflected in the language, then we should just tweak the language. That's definitely the intent. Thank you. Okay. Roll call, Kyle. Okay, Brianna Sullivan? Yes. Mike Edgington? Yes. Jennifer Wingard? Yes. Uh, Guy Wade? Yes. Amanda Sassy? Yes. Okay, so now you're back to the original amendment, or the, the original resolution as amended motion. Okay. I don't have anything more to speak to this. Okay, thank you. So. Discussion. Discussion. Yeah. And roll call for second amendment. Brianna, Brianna Sullivan? Yes. Mike Edgington? Yes. Jennifer Wingard? Yes. Guy Wade? Yes. Amanda Sassy? Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for patience with me. Number 10, Girdwood Trails Committee requests for approval of Huddle AK, proposal to complete the Girdwood Trails master plan at 22680 from the Parks and Rec 406 account. Yes. Uh, and let me pull up something because uh, there is a Huddle proposal in there, but I... Um, Updated it today, and I forgot to give it to Margaret before she created the packet. So I just want to make sure we have it up here. So, um, what we are at requesting is an additional twenty-two thousand out of uh, the operating budget. Excuse me, the capital budget for to complete the Gerwood Trails plan um, uh, with Huddle uh, to retain their services. Um, we have already uh, spent a portion of this money. Um, and that was dealing with uh, mostly with work sessions. Uh, it took, uh, we were only scoped for one work session, but it took an additional four work sessions to complete the work there. Um, so that was 4960. Uh, the scope calls for one more future work session, which we feel we're going to have after the public comments um, to work through that. Um, and we had to do two additional. Um, uh, subcommittee meetings, and those are the meetings right before GTC, uh, and so that was for the 2730 there, and then we are uh, predicting that we at least have two more, um, or two more that we would work through, and then there would be money set aside uh, of $7,400 to um, have Holly services to get us through the approval process, which would be GTC, uh, GBOS, HL, HLBAC, um, um, the Planning and Zoning Commission, and UDC uh, at those levels if we need them by the time we get to those levels. So that'd be 7,400 bucks. So um, what what is owed, and I would like to use capital funds, otherwise I would use my operating budget to pay for these, is $11,310 uh, for work completed and then $11,370 for future work on the Gruwood Trails plan. Just a quick one. So it sounds like you, I mean, you, you've been working with them quite a while and you're pretty sure that um, after comments or something that additional work sessions won't be required, do you? Well, we're just going to push, it, basically, um, at this point in time, we, we try to work with the committee as much as possible to be as accommodating as possible to work out issues, but um, we're to the point where we're, we're at the end and we need the committee to make decisions and make hard decisions. And so we will allow for one more work session with them, okay. um, which is a three hour work session. Um, and we're pretty focused down on the issues that we're dealing with now. And then it would be two subcommittees. We meet with the subcommittee one more time in September and we will uh, probably not meet with them again until we feel we can have a meeting which will be productive and hopefully lead out of committee into the Gerwood Trails Committee at that point. So um, we will have a work session probably in between then and then we will move forward from there. So um, the committee will be hard and fast in this. If they want to have additional meetings, I'll just we'll tell them uh, simply that we do not have the funding to make it work and uh, we will be probably pushing that on to GTC at that point for them to approve it. Okay, thank you. Thank 
you, Kyle, because I felt uh, a little uncomfortable uh, giving more power or authority to the subcommittee to just say that they needed more meetings because it's usurping more funds and time of everyone involved. So I think that what you just said is succinct and helps my peace of mind. No, I think that's fair. You know, sometimes you got to move on if you're they're given a time frame way back when the subcommittee was formed. Any other comments? Can you remind us how much uh, we already approved and have already spent on this project? Uh, we have approved Holly's fees was uh, uh, $48,000. And then the total contract fee, I believe, was $51,000. And three of that went to the Bate Company for um, uh, basically, Bate Company is the prime contractor, and they brought in Holly because there was such a demand by the uh, Trails Committee and at the GBOS level too, uh, that Holly be on this project because of her connection to um, the Gerwood uh, uh, area plan. And so we had to go through a lot of steps to get that to happen. So we had to pay a overhead cost to uh, Bate Company in that aspect to handle building and all that. So. So this is a pro this represents approximately a 45% spend on top of the original budget. Just about yes. Yeah. That's for all the additional work with the subcommittee. Right. So I, I I feel that a lot of the work, a lot of the additional work went into things that were completely outside the scope of the subcommittee and outside the scope of the trails plan in general. Um, it's wandered into all sorts of areas of land use which are, which are being dealt with in the area plan. And whatever this subcommittee, if we even, even if we end up with the trails plan, effectively gets rediscussed and potentially overridden um, by the area plan. So I feel a little disappointed we've kind of, I think, spent quite a bit of money on things that are outside the scope. Um, and we could have probably more, been much more effective and less wasteful if we had stayed within the uh, original scope of the project. And I don't feel that comfortable about throwing more money at the problem, because um, I don't think there's necessarily going to be any change in the future if we stick with the subcommittee. So although we don't have a motion, I'm going to move, I'm going to move that we um, we approve the money that's been spent so far, uh, which would be what well, eleven thousand three hundred and ten. I'd entertain a second to the motion that was stated. I'll second that. Seconded by Jennifer. Kyle. So if that if that goes through and you don't approve the future funding, then we're 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 saying that Holly services are no longer leading. I think that's what the vote would be. Yes. Which at probably at that point in time the plan stops. I, I guess that would have to be the outcome, or it would be taken on by the trails committee, which is where it has to go anyway. Okay, just want to be clear on the intention. Can I make a mm -hmm. comment? Um, it seems to me at this point, you know, you don't want to throw, you know, good money after bad or whatever that saying is, but um, they're, you know. 20% or less within getting the deliverable of what they set out to to attain and it seems like at this point to wash your hands of it you're you're not just losing the additional money but then you're losing the 30 40 K on top of that that we that has already been, been spent and has produced a product that's close to being completed so seems to me to I mean I hate to say this and because it's scope creep and all this happens in, in all projects and you know when do you pull the when do you pull the plug but um, to me you know if they're if we feel assured that this isn't going to happen you know again and again then and I think it sounds like the people involved understand what happened and will allow it to happen again but um, it just seems like it's a little late to pull the plug on at this point and then just be and then not have anything 
no product at the end of it. So. I would say we, put, I, we disagree with that characterization a little bit because we do have a product. We have a draft now which has gone out for public comment. Um, so I think you'll, I think probably, uh, I'm going to make an amendment again. Um, I'm going to amend my initial motion that um, I think it's reasonable to probably to get it to a point where it could go back to GTC and go through that process. Um, it would be reasonable to at least approve the um, funding both of what's being spent and um, what would be necessary to uh, present the public comment or include the do the additional draft review um, and revise with uh, public comments. So maybe it should be a little bit more than. Oh, that's sorry. That's already being spent, isn't it? Sorry. Let me just work through this. I'm trying to think live, and it's painful. So the. Kyle, so section 12, which is the draft review and revisions, has already been done. Correct. And that had to do a lot with what the subcommittee was giving back to Holly about what she'd written okay. in that aspect. So it doesn't, so does that include incorporating the public comments from the general public? What she would do is she would incorporate the general comments, but she still has to work through the subcommittee. So if she could still incorporate the general public comments, but she wouldn't have any input from the subcommittee to complete that. Since it has to go from the subcommittee to um, into the trans committee, why can't we just do that and not have this additional step? Because there's, there's very stark complications and comments that it should have the support of the subcommittee before it comes up. So this would help to hopefully resolve those, or at least if it doesn't, we have, the subcommittee's had a chance to discuss the, the, the community input that's come back. And then if they don't, if they don't make a motion, and if they, even if they vote against it, it still should come up to the trails committee for them to vote on. But at least gives a chance to hopefully they come up with a resolution and, and pass a plan out to, to JTC to consider. So we're basically spending $4,000, so that's line eight and line 10, to see if, to basically get a vote out of the subcommittee as to whether they can agree or not. Correct. Yeah. Um, I think I can give you the answer for less than $4,000. That, that to me just seems like throwing money up for no, for no good value. I just personally do not see the value of it going back through the subcommittee. And it seems like, uh, you know, we're throwing money at a problem which is not being solved in the additional five work sessions and additional four subcommittee meetings it hasn't been solved in nine meetings. I don't think that one more is going to solve it. So I'll stick with my original. I'm not going to make it. And Kyle, on number 12, you fixed the dates, right? Document Correct. edits between May 2nd and June 1st. Correct. Okay. Any comments from Amanda? Okay. I have a couple questions. Yes. So, Mike, your comment about feeling like the scope wasn't properly attended to from the get-go or along along the route, is that based on your personal experience in this or from the outside looking at spreadsheet or, or can you talk about where uh, that Yeah, sure. That's, that's based on um, both um, being an observer of the subcommittee meetings and the work sessions. Uh, and seeing the output. So the, the, the main issue is that the, um, the trail plan, trail master plan has gone a long way into questions of land use. Um, and I suppose it can, but whatever, the, if the trail plan is adopted or is accepted, it's then gonna get overwritten by whatever land use decisions are made in the area plan. So in an ideal world, you do them the other way around. You do the area plan first, get your general land use designation sorted out, and then within that, you do the trails master plan. But for a variety of reasons, we decided to do them the other order, which would work as long as trails stayed within trails. But trails, as most of the discussion, I would say, in the work sessions and subcommittee meetings have been about issues of land use, not really about trails, probably 50-50, um, generously. So we've spent, a, that, that group has spent a lot of time talking about land use issues, which are actually outside the remit of the trails plan anyway. So we've already spent a lot of time and additional money discussing things which are out of scope. And you know, throwing all money at the problem, I don't think is going to solve it. It's 
still going to result in it result in a lot of discussions about things that, that group cannot uh, resolve or doesn't seem to be able to resolve. So since it has to go back to trails anyway, my suggestion is do that now rather than waste another four thousand dollars before we do that anyway. I'm curious if there's anybody there's nobody here from trails. There's there is, nobody else here from that. Uh, there actually is, yes. So Amanda is actually on the subcommittee. So. And I've been. Go ahead, Amanda. Yeah, the, it's interesting what Brent brings up. It's, um, it is pretty frustrating sometimes that we are keep circling about to issues that are not supposed to be in the scope. Uh, what were you going to say, Oh, I was just going to tell Jennifer that I have also been on almost every meeting as a listener, and I feel that my seat here is representative of our community because I listen to other people and what they think, not just my opinion. And uh, <laughs> I can tell all those people on that committee are very frustrated for a good portion of the meeting, but Holly is doing a fantastic job being the moderator and being like the unbiased person. So when she takes, she and Kyle, but when she takes all these comments, I don't feel that it will serve our community of Girdwood to have it go back to the subcommittee for them to hash out what they already feel is personally wrong because they have attachments to things they, they feel very strongly about. And we're just gonna put more money to this. And they've been spending a lot of time over the several months. And um, Polly's done a great job. But I, I don't, I agree with Mike. Um, that's what I was trying to say. Would Holly, I mean, there's no, this isn't like an engineer drafting something that's going to get stamped, right? So going right. through the subcommittee again. It's just a proposal. Wouldn't bother, it wouldn't affect her ability to complete something, a final product. No. I'm sorry. No. Okay, so we have a, a second, and we've had a discussion, and if we are ready to come to a decision, I just like a clarification on the vote. Kyle. Yeah, I would too. Um, so it sounds like the vote, what the motion is, is that, um, in the second right now is that we would pay for the completed section but not for the future section so we pay for eleven thousand three hundred and ten dollars that has been completed out of the capital account but not uh you would gbos would not approve the eleven thousand three hundred seventy dollars for future work with the subcommittee was that that's how i thought you had amended or you had I, I was going to amend it because I misunderstood line 12. I thought line 12 was future work, but it's past work. So it's I past work. line 12 should be including what we pay for. So does that make sense, Guy? Okay. Right, we'll, we'll, we'll pay the whole group. Um, the completed. What we owe them. I have a question as well. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to jump in in front of you. Um, so where does that leave us? What happens next? She That's finishes was, up the work. That's what I was going to ask. I was going to ask if we um, if we took what we have now, if what we have now includes public all the public comment work or does it not? That's what I'm not clear about. Yeah, I, in, in what I understand, yes, it does complete complete it does include the public, public comment so it has been and we produce a final edit. So it'd be within the hands of just uh, basically her and I go through the public comment and make a decision as to what we saw out of public comment and then give it to GTC. Okay. At that point, we wouldn't have Holly services going forward through GTC if the if the future funding is not approved. Okay. If, if, if um, um, what would be the overhead in if we if GTC decide to go forward with it? Um, we're talking about seventy-four hundred dollars, or thereabouts, to to take it through the rest of the process. Yeah, that's it. Um, would that be starting? That would be starting a new contract, and would have overheads associated with it if we did it that way. 
if we went back and started a new contract? Well, if we if we wanted to go through the um, the plan approval process with the document, would that be? If we don't approve the funding, then presumably that would have to be under a new contract. Uh, no, we, you just wouldn't. You, you know. There's two things here. I think if you approve the $7,400, then you would retain Holly to represent the plan as it went forward. And so okay. if you wanted, she, her and I would finish the work and then we would start the approval process. And if it made out GTC, she would stay with me and we would be there to consult as people had questions about the plan okay. in that aspect. If and not, I would have to carry it on my own. And does this, does this um, costing assume that it passes at every level? Yes, at this clear. point in time, that's it's getting all the way through UDC seventy four hundred dollars. But if it did not, if it did not pass a GTC, for example, then, then, it, it, then it would stop. Okay. Yeah, so I would no longer need her services because the plan can't move forward. Okay. So, in that case, I will propose an amendment. Okay. So, as it stands, we, I think the motion is just we approve what's been spent. So I would offer an amendment that we approve what's been spent plus the 7,400, um, 7,400 to get it through the final approval process. I do entertain a motion for a second. Second. Okay, discussion. I think that I think that gives us most flexibility, doesn't it? Yeah, so you're, you're approving what's completed plus the $7,400 for helping with the plan approval process. Right. And that just eliminates the work sessions and additional meetings with um, the, the subcommittee. So the subcommittee would essentially be done. Right. We won't have a September meeting. We won't have a, another meeting after that. So, and there will so be no work session. brought it this far, did all the work needed to get yes. public comment and then We'll notice, we'll notify that the subcommittee, uh, I mean, they could meet and just Holly wouldn't be there and I would have to meet with them. And that may be the way it happens, but Holly wouldn't be there to support the process at that point. So. Yeah, but no other Sullivan? Yes. Uh, Mike Edgington? Yes. Jennifer Wingard? Yes. Uh, Guy Wade? Yes. Uh, Amanda Sassy? Yes. Uh, that, uh, that amendment to the original motion passes, and so you're back to the original motion as amended. Okay, I call for a vote for the original motion. As amended. As amended. Thank you. Sure, to the roll call. Uh, Brianna Sullivan? Yes. Mike Edgington? Yes. Uh, Jennifer Wingard? Yes. Guy Wade? Yes. Amanda Sassy? Yes. Uh, that motion as amended passes 5-0. Okay. Thank, Thank you for the discussion, everyone. Number 11, economic development tax exemptions under service area boards. Mike yeah. Edgington. So um, this is something that came up a couple of assembly, several assembly meetings ago. Um, and it's a, it's kind of a really technical, down in the weeds um, issue that we've, we've by, because of some changes in um, municipal code, Anchorage municipal code, um, Girdwood has lost the opportunity of um, using certain types of uh, tax credits, um, or at least tax um, abatement credits, or tax uh, exemptions. Um, for economic development. So that's something that's been um, something I've had some discussions um, with uh, the previous administration about and um, that's come up in sort of general discussions in the area plan as well. Um, cost of development is difficult here. Providing some forms of uh, tax relief is one way you can make things pencil out better economically. Um, and as I said, this, other, this change in the municipal code um, took away some of the um, some of the potential benefits uh, for doing that within Goodwood and parts of Eagle River um, and parts of the hillside. And I don't think it was intended. I think it was just uh, an accidental um, clash between 
assumptions in state law and assumptions in municipal law. Mainly the state law says that if the service area board basically sets tax rates, as Anchorage Municipal Code says the service area merely advises and the rates are set by uh, the assembly. And that difference causes um, a problem and effectively lost us the flexibility of using them at all. So uh, I've started some discussions with uh, our state re our state law representatives. Um, and I've also had a couple of discussions with the um, with a uh, with an attorney, uh, pro bono, informally over coffee, um, about what the options are here, and uh, I think we'll just we'll just pursue it with um, the assembly and see what the options are with the assembly and the state legislature, um, and then come up with a sort of formal proposal for formal action in the future. This is probably going to be a, I mean, there's nothing right in front of us that we need to solve this for, but uh, it may be an option in the next, um, you know, in the next six months. For example, there's something that could come up um, in the uh, in the development uh, in Holt Hills and uh, the Escobilla. So it's not theoretical, it's a very practical problem that we may face relatively soon, but it's not imminent. So we'll keep this on the agenda and uh, we'll discuss it with the both the union and the state.
when it comes to exemptions, but then still insisting or still stating that they set the rate and service area board do not set the rate. So we get the we get the kind of cost of both sides. So it's clearly a mismatch between the state code and the municipal code, and it just needs to be resolved somehow. Okay. That was too much information. <laughs> Any other questions for Mike? Thank you, Mike. Staying up on that. I look forward to the next the next presentation on this. Number 12, review and vote on 2022 Urban Valley Service Area Budgets. Kyle. Sure. Um, yeah, since this is the uh, opportunity for the board to vote on it, I will give a quick overview of the budget for the Gerwitz service area, and then we can go uh, by each department uh, for approval. Um, but quickly, I just want to give a synopsis of the Gerwitz uh, uh, mill levy. And uh, what you have in front of you here, and I'll blow this up a little bit, is the um, historical for Gerwitz mill uh, rate. And the mill rate is what we basically set our taxes off of. And, uh, and Gerwitz service area is regulated by uh, having no larger than a 6.0 mill rate. Um, and so as you can see, our 10-year uh, average uh, for our mill rate has been 4.57. Uh, the reason we really jumped into the fives is because we took on police services um, back in uh, 2016 and started to have a payment for those when the troopers left. So that, that raised our mill there. Um, and, uh, and so last year, our mill rate was uh, 5.07. And that was probably really reflective of the fact that uh, the assessment of properties here in Gerwood significantly increased in last year, um, even though uh, we did have a little bit of rise in our operating budget, so our mill rate went down. Um, overall, we've averaged, uh, uh, and this is for everybody in Anchorage, uh, for area-wide services, which include um, EMS, uh, the dog catcher, the library, uh, the sign and paint shop, we paint your roads and put your signs up. Uh, we have actually paid nothing for that. Um, and that uh, for an average of, of zero mil. Uh, this year we did pay a .05 uh, for the Gerwood service area, which is very small, um, but that covers a lot of services. There's a lot of other, other, other revenues that feed that uh, area-wide uh, services. So that, that's why sometimes you see a rebate there um, sometimes on the mill rate. And then for the school district, uh, we've averaged 7.25 over 10 years. Last year, the Anchor School District operating mill rate was 7.83. Uh, what was new for last year is that we started paying uh, the school bond debt. The state used to cover this and most recently made the move that they pushed that back to the municipalities and, and boroughs, um, which created a new tax. So the state essentially taxed us without taxing us um, by uh, creating this bond reinvent mill. So uh, bond debt is now has an, its own mill rate, which is 1.09. So that was last year, the first time. So overall, Gerwood had a 3.59 mil um, for the municipality, um, where our average over 10 years is 11.9. And so really the rise for that uh, compared to the average is police and the Anchorage School District bond. Now you compare that to downtown or the city core of Anchorage, and uh, they pay 17.9. So we are definitely significantly less uh, than uh, downtown. And we, I would say we are the lowest tax district with all essential services. So that means police, road maintenance, fire, um, parks and rec, uh, those things. Uh, Gerwood is the lowest uh, there. And overall, I think we're the fifth lowest tax district um, in, uh, in Anchorage. And there's a lot of tax districts within Anchorage. So, so uh, that's where we stand with our mill rate there. This is all in the pack of the back too, so you have one to look at closer. It just explains how we come up with our mills and what that means. So like a 13.59 mill um, on an $800,000 property, you're paying $10,000 in taxes a year. You know, on a $100,000 property, you're paying $1,383 a year um, in that aspect. So it kind of just gives you a breakdown where it's at. 
Um, this table is wrong because uh, I, I got some budgets and I just think have time to update this table and, and things have changed. But this kind of just gives you a reflection of, of how we break down the different mills and how it relates to each department. And it also gives you a breakdown of what the Gerwitz service area, which you pay for in different areas and, and what percentage. So of the total taxes collected, and this is, you know, uh, based on the assessment of, a, I think, a $500,000 house um, or $721,000 house, um, you are paying 11% for parks, 19% for police, 35% for fire, and 33% for um, for uh, street maintenance. So, um, so when you, you can see, like on a big house like that, twelve hundred and forty-seven dollars. Sometimes people pay more in driveway plowing for plowing out their driveway in a winter, uh, as to what your contribution is for all the streets here and taking care of. So, so you can kind of see how that works um, in that aspect. And and you know, fire for thirteen hundred dollars, you, you pay more in home insurance and in that aspect. So you get quite a few services for for what you pay for. Um, and this gives a breakdown of all the different services and how they're related to the different areas that Greerwood pays for. Um, all, our, all our services are collected by property taxes. We don't have other income sources like sales tax or, or uh, bed tax that comes back and helps offset our property taxes. Okay, if you like, um, we can start with fire and I'll pull up the most current sheet for fire. Can I ask a question too? Well, Michelle, you want to come up to the mic? Or? Oh, sure. Uh, so uh, after uh, the work session today, um, we ended up working back home about the Lincoln Park Ordinance. Um, and I remember that was here and she asked, and she asked to have asked you guys to talk about that. Yeah, that's something that we have been working on since last month. And uh, it's something that we've been working on since last month. And it's something that we've been working on since last month. And she felt like I was being too uh, stingy, I guess. So she'd like to have more review and the board to have more time to look at it. Who's that? Paula Bogdan. She's a board member. She's a board member. So because the board hasn't had, the, the board meets quarterly, and so they have had uh, some discussion, but they haven't had seen the latest numbers. And for clarification, this is the Gerwood Fire Board that represents the nonprofit. Yeah. Which was a surprise, but that happened after I walked out of the room. So. Um, that's correct. Sure. So, so how long did, if, if this does happen, did she set a time frame on it? Or I mean, she said gonna... that she was going to go talk to the board and have a meeting, set up a meeting. Okay, it wouldn't wait till the next quarterly. No, meeting. no, which would be in October, right? Which would be far too late. So, um, no. So, she asked if we, if you could consider postponing it, but I recognize that you have to get this done quickly. So. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Question. Question? Um, so when we when do we need to provide this information yeah. uh, from here? Because I, I feel uncomfortable about uh, approving three parts or three quarters of the budget if we have no idea what the other number is going to be, because I think we have to consider the whole thing together. So I'd like to, although we vote individually, I don't really want to consider you know some next month and some this month. Uh, I think my due date is the OMB has requested them by the, uh, let me just take a look here real quick. OMB has, they sent a calendar, that's the calendar that we work off of on. So I think they're due by the 27th, so they'd be a week from this Friday. 27th? Yes, yeah. and just due to the fact that the GBS schedule, this is the way it worked out for approval. So we do not have time to meet that calendar, we do not have time to vote on this next month. No, you would have to do a special meeting to have it ready. It, it, even, 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 yeah, it would be way too late to go the next month. Yeah. So we do have the opportunity to change uh, the budget in the first quarter revisions next year. Yes, right. you do. Yep. I mean, again, I, I, think I, I said this earlier in the budget meeting, in the budget work session, but I, I feel like our calendar has been, uh, you know, our schedule for deciding these has been well advertised and definitely the fire. The fire department, I believe the fire board should have been aware of this. Um, and I don't feel comfortable postponing it. Definitely not by a month. We can't do it in a month. Even by another week, I think that's uh, probably unreasonable, but other people may disagree. It is a little late process <laughs> to, to do this, and 
that I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I understand that they would like to, you know, um, support their, their fire department as best best they can, but. Um, I'm not sure what else we would do to this budget besides rearrange numbers and be able to stay under our mill rate where we have to be anyway, um, unless we started reducing other budgets at that point, which have pretty much held flat for you know year after year with slight increases. So I, I could see the, the the wanting to review it. I don't know how much how many changes at this point you can make to it if you did want to increase it and we'd be able to pass it because it would it wouldn't fall under the mill rate at that point so i would also point out that um, in when we have the opportunity for first quarter budget revisions next year we will know what's happened to assess property prices again if there's a very significant increase then um, that gives us context in which to discuss any uh, any cost changes um, and so we'll just have a better we'll have a better understanding of what this is actually going to cost in terms of dollars and cents. Is that really a feasible thing to do, though? I mean, have you done that in the past? To yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll change the police, we'll probably change the police budget based on uh, on what actually happens with the oh, with uh, the, the cost of uh, living increase or the CPIU change. So again, we will know what the increase in the police budget is when uh, potentially we discuss. Uh, fire department budget to gain. Okay, Kyle, would you like to continue or we have another question in the audience? Uh, well, I think if, if you guys would like to move forward with considering this for a vote tonight, then I probably would have Michelle give a presentation so that we can go through the presentation process and then open it up to the public for comments. Okay. Let's do that, please. Sorry, Michelle, uh, sorry, Chief, could I just back up uh, one little bit? I didn't understand, did, did, no, yeah, I mean, <laughs> sorry, 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 I mean, just before you give your whole presentation, can you just clarify, did, did, was, was Paula and the board, were they asking for a specific extension? Like, did, did they give you a set amount of time that they wanted extended, or? Uh, she was concerned because I have, you know, you know, as we've seen many different versions of this budget, I had asked for more, right. and now I've scaled it back, recognizing that I've been through two budget meetings here where I kept hearing flat budget, so I've scaled it down, um, recognizing that it's been in flat budget for a number of years, and while the police contract gets increased, fire doesn't, so whatever. Um, but, you know, so she knows that there's some looming things, so she was just like, is that incorporated? And I'm like, no, because we're well, just trying to get flat budget-ish, so. But in asking for more time, did she say, you know, 48 hours, four I, days, four, four weeks, did she, did she give a time? I think it would happen quickly, but, you know, I, again, I recognize that this is the third budget meeting. Okay. And, you know. So there was, okay. yeah, and, and truthfully, I did not give this to them to look at again. We've talked about budgets at a number of meetings, and I did not because I was literally whittling it down right before the meeting. Somewhere. Right. So, so that's it's on my that's my fault for not giving it to them to have a meeting. No, that's right. So, okay. I'd just like to make a comment on the flat budget statement. Um, we know for a long while we, the, the good of taxpayers, have been subsidizing the area way EMS. So we put a lot of cap political capital into trying to resolve oh, that. Great. We've got a partial resolution. Okay. So you know, the budget for the fire department as a whole has gone up by 300,000. Um, we're still probably subsidizing EMS, but to a lesser extent. So yeah, one, what, we're, what we're doing is having, having worked to get the EMS side increased, we're keeping the fire department flat, but that's still an increase overall. Oh, totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. No, I'm not throwing stones at anybody. No, no. I just, just you may I mis just, people may misunderstand what flat budget means. I, I just, you, you know, up. I feel like police came in after us, and and since then it's been a case of well, we can't, we have to make room for police. It totally makes sense, but they get a, they get an increase and new trucks and, and you know they have the nice vehicles and everything and then I look at our vehicles that have holes in them and that and I know we're working towards replacing stuff but you know it's just it's a it's a, unfortunately the cost of the business I wish everything was free and I hope the, con I hope the new contract does have the uh, cost of living increase built into it uh, at last 
check it. They took it out. Oh, well, maybe you should go back in. So. Like we have before, 
or we'll take the forestry deployment money and we'll pay that with salaries versus paying me. So we'll just defer that and we'll work on things that way. So we have ways to sort of defer things, but the, where it gets down to it is when we don't have payroll, when we have payroll obligations and we can't meet them because we don't have enough funding, which has happened multiple times. What they used to do, what the fire chiefs used to do here is they made people who work here uh, volunteer for shifts and take unpaid shifts, which was actually sort of a payroll violation. But that's how the department did okay for a number of years. Um, but uh, we stopped that when I came here because it was frankly illegal. Uh, and then um, the other thing that the chiefs used to do here is they furlough everybody in here and not pay them uh, because we ran out of money. So, you know, the fire department has this history of having an duty funding situation. Um, but I hope that with that 300,000 coming in, we'll hopefully stabilize it a bit. Because we fixed a lot of the other problems in the past three years, four years in the department, but still just getting the funding done and stable, I think would be huge to improve things around here. So your budget this year is the same as last year uh, on the fire side, same dollar amount with the, with the added 35K that you haven't had to do in the past. Year, we're asking for the 35K. Okay. Thank you. Andy. Yeah, and then there's also the capital contribution. We've kind of discussed that before. With, I think as a board, we've already made a commitment to uh, to that approach for um, paying for the engine. At least we we had a vote on the. We have a vote on it. They're still working out the details, of getting quotes for engine 41. So as soon as we know what engine it's going to be and what the final cost yeah. is, and then we go and we work with the finance guy and we get the whole package, we'll present that to the yeah. board. We've had discussions on the principle. I think we. Right. The research is still happening. Yeah. So we'd be making the we'd be making a commitment to funding what we think the price would be, but that will vary depending on the details. We may need to change that first quarter too, but right now we're against somewhere in the eighty thousand dollar range a year. Yep. So yeah, so the so effectively operating costs we're paying an extra thirty five thousand and there's another three hundred thousand coming from the on the EMS side for the overall cost. Yes. So the overall budget is mm -hmm. quite Which a bit so. larger this year. Yes, correct, and we already and we already improved the staffing, uh, which was something that AFD had asked us to do because when we don't have enough staffing, we have to call down AFD to cover us. Uh, the FISA number will probably go down. Uh, Chief Shrongi mentioned to me the other day that uh, when we send people to car accidents in the past and Anchorage backfills us and then we charge a FISA, he's going to take
the money coming from the, there was money which was associated with the contract, um, which was a proportion of that 300,000, and then the assembly separately approved the difference between what was tied to the contract and the 300,000 which really agreed. So I think that, which way around was it? It was like 175,000 was supposed to be coming with the contract, about 125,000 from the assembly. So that 125,000 should be guaranteed. The 175 is slightly unclear because that was assuming the contract was signed in June. So there is still some wiggle room for the um, for the municipality to say that because the, it has not been signed until so, August, they will reduce. So the, the so the good news the good news is, again yes. Yeah, so last week I was very distressed about this, and uh, when I went to talk to them. Um, they both, Chief One and the municipal manager said, we will get the contract signed, we will give you the money, You're, you won't shut down. So I have to take them on their word that just as those assembly actions happen, that they will be shortly providing us with the contract update that we've all worked on for three years now, and we'll get the funding. And so you're asking for 35000 more Yes, for, for, for next year. For next year. Uh, well, three, the 300000 in my mind, was already approved by the Assembly as the contract increase. You might recall, working with AFD, we asked OMB for 600000 and we ended up with 300000 or 175, and you know, then we got back to then we got back to 300. Uh, so yes, but again, the Board of Supervisors only control fire, uh, so that's why we're just talking about fire. Yeah, so, you know, Assembly and First Quarter Revisions approved the additional 300000 The administration hasn't released it because they haven't finished the contract, so they're waiting for the 300000 to come. So in 2021, there is already additional 300000 approved for Gerwig. It's at the hostage of the administration right now, as soon as they let go of it, and the fire department can get it to and, he's, and she's been operating at the level that's within the contract that's not signed. So yeah. we're hoping that they come through on their end. This again, we need to Next year will be a level budget on the EMS side because the three are thousands yes. already been approved for this year. Right. So. The increase will be the thirty-five thousand for medical exams, and then the eighty thousand. And that eighty thousand may not be used. It depends on what happens. But the eighty thousand sitting there for the start of the yeah. payments on engine forty-one. Yeah. Otherwise, if it isn't used, we'll drop it into capital and start paying it later. Point of order: We need a motion to go past ten o'clock. Yeah, I move to uh, extend the meeting from ten thirty. Need a second. Second. Should we do a vote by saying aye? See if anybody dissents. Any dissents? Okay, continue. Can I, for the purposes of moving forward, can I uh, make a motion that we approve 2022 uh, fire budget of $1,279,002? Second. Any further discussion? I call for a vote. Brianna Sullivan? Yes. Mike Edgington? Yes. Uh, Jennifer Wingard? Yes. Guy Wade? Yes. Amanda Sassy? I'm sorry. Uh, that happened really quickly. Are we voting on uh, approving this budget? Correct. Okay. I think that I did have a check in to press on mute. Um, that is passes for one. Thank you. Can I, can I just say, I'd just like to give a huge thank you again to Chief Weston, because I know you've done a lot of work on this. It's, uh, any apparent tension is not about, uh, there's no reflection on you. Exactly. So we're going to still spend effort on that. 
Yes, Thank I, you. I ditto that too for sure. So. Okay, street maintenance. Um, so this is our street maintenance, and uh, uh, the first section is personnel costs, and this is where our salaries for Margaret and I come out of for the service area as, as muni employees here in, in the service area. Uh, I am representing a small increase uh, to that area um, just because of the annual cost of living increases there. Um, you can see the increases over time, so it kind of reflects the averages that we've seen uh, for the last three years the last two years uh, up to here so that that would be the increase there uh, down in non-labor um, the increase uh, um, well first the decrease would be the increase would be for office supplies uh, we're, we're paying for paper again uh, we have a new copier that we supply uh, the resources for that uh, that we share with the fire department and then um, I am decreasing fuel because I looked at my averages over the last five years and that's about where we're at there with fuel um, and then um, everything else is about the same uh, except uh, communication I did drop it down a bit just because I looked at the averages on that for the last five years um, so we brought that down to where that was in that, in that range so um, so uh, overall with that it's just uh, uh, just under a thousand dollar increase in non-labor uh, with the changes there um, the big one in this budget is the road contribution um, I do feel that we need to start replenishing the roads capital account because we just had a big expenditure with the Alberg paving project and so that budget has come down and as we've discussed through the work sessions I do feel that the service area needs a strong capital count in all areas as we have infrastructure that will age and we have new uh, more developed infrastructure with storm drain and and um, sidewalks and street lights and things like that and they're they're still fairly young for certain areas uh, but they will age and they will need replacement so I think the service area needs to be prepared for that because bonding is not really an option for us down here because we can never get anchorage to support our bonds even though Gerwig tends to vote for bonds and doesn't cost an anchorage a dime. Um, but just the way things are, that's the way it goes. So Gerwig needs to save the money slowly to do these replacements as they come. Uh, Intergovernment charges, these are just predictions, but um, and I'm just copying the same uh, charges that we get from other departments um, uh, to support us. And so uh, I just copied last year's to give us uh, some sort of idea. It's usually close to where it was years previous. Um, and then overall, we do think we'll get some revenues. Um, and so we do estimate that we'll probably have $6,000 in revenue um, coming in. And so that will help, help to at least offset some of the tax burden on the taxpayers. It's not much, but um, it's what we can generate uh, through this budget. Um, so uh, the change in this would be 106000 from last year. And that's because we're increasing that cap the contribution to capital. Um, um, overall, so uh, we'd be looking at a one million two hundred ninety thousand two hundred forty-eight dollar budget uh, for 2021, uh, with a mill rate estimated right now at 2.08. Those assessments uh, um, have changed, so that mill rate probably go down a bit, uh, but that kind of gives you the high end there. So that's what we're looking at for streets. Entertain a motion to approve streets maintenance budget. I move to uh, approve street maintenance budget of uh, roads and streets for one million two hundred ninety thousand two hundred forty-eight dollars. Second. I'll second that. Okay. Question from Jerry. Uh, what's in the capital account? Uh, I think I got uh, available, not encumbered. I think we have about 360000 in the road budget. And we were at almost 700000 before the Auburn project, which we, we combined that project with the remaining state grant we had. Well, at this point in time, no. I'm hoping that I can do my fish passage uh, one passage at a time through our term contract with Western out of our operating budget because they're pretty they're pretty uh, accomplished in that area. They've just got done doing several in Tionic, and so um, we're going to work. 
it through. If I can't afford that, then yes, I'll start pulling out a couple dollars uh, and doing it that way. The hard part is, is that it's ideal to do all three fish sausages because then you pay for one mob in and out and you got a crew and they tend to be more competitive on the price, but uh, that's going to be almost 900000 by the time we get done with it. So if I do one fish passage each year, then I can, we, the service area can afford to do it and we can start to build back on our capital at the same time. We, uh, one useful data point here is we estimated that um, just to do repaving on all the additional um, paved road in Girdwood that's, that's basically we've acquired in the last decade or so, uh, would cost us about, uh, I think it was just about 1.2 million or something, over the course of about 15 years. So if we were just putting money away in order to cover additional paving work, it would be you know, 80, 90,000 a year. So uh, you know, putting out an additional 100,000 is not that unreasonable. That gives us a little bit beyond just repaving work. Any other discussion? Call for a vote. Uh, Brianna Sullivan? Yes. Mike Edgington? Yes. Uh, Jennifer Wingard? Yes. Guy Wade? Yes. Amanda Sassy? Yes. Mo motion passes 5-0. Okay. Uh, the next one is our parks and rec budget. Um, and so once again, labor, we just increased that a little bit in the hopes that our uh, seasonal staff return. Uh, they are union employees, so if they do return, they will see a bump in pay. Uh, so that would represent that there. Um, they've been excellent for us, we hope to get them back. Uh, we did increase the operating supplies a bit, giving more money to each of our different areas that we deal with, from ballpark to skate, uh, the skate park to um, tree removal, disc golf. But one thing we did reduce is the hand tram, as we don't receive a hand tram reopening, but it does still need general maintenance uh, to keep it uh, safe and inspected until the next phase of what happens out there uh, does happen. Uh, so we, re we reduced that to $500. Um, and then we have, we did increase our trail maintenance and grooming just because we are doing a lot more in trail work and then our winter maintenance uh, for grooming is mostly going towards uh, grooming parts uh, for either the snow machine or the, the grooming apparatuses We've, where machines are getting a bit older and so we, we're constantly doing repairs and maintenance to keep them going, especially when we have a good winter like we did last year. So, And then we also increased a little bit of money for our aerating and seeding. We've been having great success with our fields and working with local arborists to get that done. Uh, so, so those are uh, the primary uh, changes. Um, and the big reduction to increase the operating was in our uh, maintenance and repair contract with our um, SCA. We have the Student Conservation Corps come out. We used to have them come for four weeks, and this year we're just gonna. Next year we're just gonna have them come for two. And so the money that we didn't use there, we put up towards our uh, our supplies and uh, operating expenses for our different facilities. So that is the big change there. So it went from thirty-two thousand down to nineteen thousand. And then one change is um, last year is that we gave 150000 to our um, capital account. And uh, this year we even them out between capital, between roads and parks, and so they're each 125,000. So the increase you're seeing over in park and roads is also uh, being deflected by the decrease you're seeing here in in the parks budget for the capital contribution. So both areas are getting 125,000, um, which works out nicely. So. So, yep. And then IGCs, once again, just to show you reference. Um, so overall, uh, the Parks Rec budget is going from 424000 down to 399000 which is a reduction of 25000 and a mill rate of, uh, right now, an estimated 0.64. Um, but that's on the high side, so it most likely will be lower. But I'd like to give it the high side aspect. But. So there is that. Oh, 
Uh, one other thing, the two things I wanted to point out in this budget is the two primary expenses within our budget is the money that we give to donations to nonprofit organizations through the nonprofit grants. And 25,000 of that goes to the Four Valleys Community School, which is hard funded for 25,000. And 35,000 goes to those who apply for the nonprofit grants, which is 35,000. And then the other aspect is the contribution to capital. So almost half of our budget goes to those two line items um, and the rest goes to our operations in the parks so great thank you Kyle any questions or discussion we've heard it earlier tonight too so I'd entertain a motion of support for the budget move that we uh, allocate three three hundred ninety eight thousand nine hundred seventy four dollars and ten cents to uh, the parks and rec budget for 2022. Second that. I call for a vote. Sure. Uh, Brianna Sullivan. Yes. Mike Edgington. Yes. Jennifer Wingard. Yes. Guy Wade. Yes. Amanda Sassy. Yes. Motion passes five zero. Okay, uh, next one is our police uh, service contract with uh, Whittier. Um, and so uh, at this point in time, I am keeping the police service area contract with them flat. Uh, within the contract, there is a consumer price index uh, increase written into it. So the increase is established in the first quarter of the new year um, uh, by the CPI, then um, we will follow that, which we, Roughly are estimating maybe two to three percent next year, maybe four on the high end, um, which would be probably about twenty twenty thousand dollars or so. Um, but we will uh, address that in the first quarter revisions if that CPI is. Last year um, there was no increase, so the budget or the contract with them stayed flat at six seventy five, and um, and so we'll address that at that point in time. So at this point in time, we are uh, uh, requesting a flat budget. Uh, of $691,419. Um, the other aspect of the budget is that we rent the ACS building as a substation for Whittier, and then we do have a miscellaneous fund for police, uh, and we mostly use that with car towing, impounding, um, and, and buying signs, and then but this year we used it for the uh, Wind River Dog Institute that came down and helped with bear control uh, and, and paid for half of their expenses. The other bear wear, uh, raised the other half uh, for that. So, so yes, yeah, 691419 for 2022 is the request. Great. I have a question from Chief Weston. How many staff uh, are, are employed with this labor? Uh, a minimum of five, the high end is seven, but the one of the seven is mostly uh, probably staffed by the Whittier Tunnel. So the five, seven for 691,000? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Other discussion? motion? I'll move as well. Um, I move that we approve $691,419 for the police um, budget for 2022. Second. Second. I call for a vote. Brianna Sullivan? Yes. Mike Edgington? Yes. Jennifer Wingard? Yes. Guy Wade? Yes. Uh, Amanda Sassy? Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Do we have to formally do something about the um, cemetery passing budget this year? Uh, we aren't requesting one, so no. Um, but we'll just say that we do. The GBOS does have powers for fund for cemetery, but we're not requesting any funds as there's at this point in time no cemetery okay. needs. So the lack of any budget means it's zero. Yeah. Question from Jerry. Uh, I, I'm the, 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 the
yeah, and that was based off budgets that we had seen, and I didn't have a chance to replace that, but the math that we did during the last work session, we estimated that the mill rate will probably be like 5.45. 5 no, 5.89. Well, 5 .45. It, it's 5.45 based on our current assessment. Correct. Assessment. My estimate was on the high end of 5.89, but the uh, OMB, uh, when our assessment overall for the full valley goes up, the meal rate will go down. That, was, that, that calculation that Kyle mentioned at the 5.89 roughly was based on the 2020 assessment value, not the 21 assessment value. The 21 assessment value went up quite a bit, so our rate drops. That's why we're only paying just over five this year, rather than 5.5 we initially estimated. Thank you. And then lastly, I'll go through this um, and. Uh, um, and basically I'll seek a motion from the board to approve the capital projects as presented, um, you know, just to remain on this list. And if there's anything missing or you like to subtract, we could do that here. But basically uh, starting with uh, parks, uh, the Little Bear uh, building replacement, that still stays on here. We have no update. We don't know where that stands. The Little Bear board may be working privately with Alyeska Resort still to accomplish that replacement. Um, but this time we're not seeking bonding for that as we had in the past. Uh, the pedestrian crosswalk light, I just keep it on here, but we have completed that project, so we will remove that off of next year. Uh, we will present that to the board, show that some things are getting done. Um, and in the engineering design package for Glacier Creek Bridge at Winter Creek, um, we have put this on here. Uh, we are chasing actually two sources of funding. One is with the municipality, and the municipality has already committed um, 525,000 towards this project uh, to replace the hand tram out there with a bridge. Um, and so uh, the initial thing we are doing through the municipality is doing a cost assessment to really see what is the cost to put in a suspension bridge out there. Uh, so we've started that process um, with a term contractor, Bettisworth North and uh, r and and then HMS, uh, which does uh, cost estimating. And then the future long-term cost would be to build uh, the bridge, which, which right now we're, we're thinking maybe in the 1 to 1.2 range. Uh, uh, and that's off uh, expenses that we saw associated with the Byers Creek Bridge, uh, which was built up there and it's of the same design that we're kind of looking at. So, so those things will start to tune in as we learn more. Now we've come up with a cost that looks unattainable for the service area or other ways then we will probably put the brakes on and find out what to do um, but from practical experience and, and most recent experience with other buildings out there or other building of bridges out there this is what we're seeing so so we will keep the board informed as we move forward there uh, master plan uh, uh, a master plan is needed for Alyeska Playfield um, and parking lot up there as we're dealing with uh, uh, quite a bit of parking issues poor drainage on the play field um, unusable for a good portion of the summer as it dries out and just better use of the area up there that is being called out also in the trails plan as an area that needs improvement for trailhead parking and then a master plan for um, Gerwood Park here to help us with future development and, uh, and uh, management of the park. Uh, the idea a note was given to us by GBOS to suggest that we put these two plans together. So as we move forward, we will look at that route and discuss that as, as, as we go forward um, on these projects here. And then uh, eventually the redevelopment of the Alyeska Playfield area uh, to solve the poor drainage, the parking issues, and all those things up there and, and, uh, and create more of a recreational facility up there for, for that area. Uh, a request has been put in for a dog park here in town, and so we uh, thought about combining that with Trailhead at the end of uh, Corlealis Road over here, right at the beginning of the Lower Diderod Trail. Uh, they put it because the trailhead is becoming more apparent, and parking is needed down there as that trail has become more popular. So um, lots of details to work out there, especially with code. Uh, so we will keep that on the list for now. And then Lions Club has particularly been interested for several years to build a covered pavilion over in their park over there. And so we are looking at different ways of funding this. And one of them 
there's a conservation um, uh, a grant coming up through the state um, which funds uh, uh, facilities like this and so uh, we'll probably be returning to GBOS next month to present um, uh, a proposal to get the engineering done so we have a complete package that we can submit for grant funding and then work with Lions Club to uh, partner with them to help fund uh, the building of this facility so uh, we'll be bringing that forward over the coming months and then uh, batting cage um, we have this on here as a capital improvement, uh, but this will probably most likely would be a, a privately fundraised thing that we would match with a Park Foundation grant. Um, but the, the baseball teams out here have requested a batting cage, so we would try to figure that out as we go forward on uh, uh, making that happen. But I told them I'd put it on the capital list. There may be a request for a small portion from the Gerwood uh, um, capital account, but I'll let you know as we go forward. Uh, fish, fish passages, uh, so we are in need of culvert replacements on Alieska Creek at Davos, Mount Hood, and Lake Tahoe, or Moose Meadow Creek at Lake Tahoe, but that pours into Alieska Creek, and they're, they're the last three drainages before it hits Glacier Creek. Uh, those culverts are in uh, dire repair, uh, especially the one at Mount Hood, um, so we like to start that process. This has been on the list for a long time, and I think we could try to accomplish this through our current term contractor, who has the skills, knowledge, and equipment to do this and so uh, we will start working through that but we have it right now within our capital projects to complete and then power to the industrial park the industrial park is a huge area that does need addressing by the service area we need to develop our parcel better and make it more functional uh, right now we run with no power down there we're on a temporary power source the equipment can't park on our lot in the winter uh, we can't cover the snow storage we cover it with tarps and so when we have a rain on ice event uh, we're trying to dig out snow and take the snow cover off the snow storage so i think two things are really needed three things are really needed out there is power to be brought to our lot we need HLB's help to do that because HLB has not platted this section that we're in, even though right across from us there's five platted lots. So we did not get utilities brought to our lot and uh, we need to work out the issue with Chugash. Um, so Chugash will bring power to our lot. Well, luckily we share a platted lot line with AWU treatment plant. So we may have a chance to get power to our lot if we can put the transformer on the corner there next to that line. But there, there's, there's things uh, we have to work through so that is a priority and in a storage garage uh, right now we use the old fire hall over there next to little bears it is working but it's barely holding together um, we have constant maintenance to keep it from leaking and uh, buckets everywhere in the winter and in it has been uh, has been restricted to no more than three staff personnel at a time inside the building, no public at all. And uh, because of the wind shear issues associated with the building, it's just old and it, it, it's hanging in there, but it does what it does. Uh, we try to keep a loaded sand truck always in there so that when we do have a response to uh, rain on ice, we can get that truck out the door and start sanding, especially the priority areas like Echo Ridge, St. Moritz and Vail. Um, but we do need the service area to realize that in the long run we're going to need a nice warm shop to keep our materials in and equipment and for the contract to have a place they can pull in so they can weld on a grader instead of standing out in rain with us holding tarps over the welder so he can get an edge back on so we can complete um, grading or peeling ice so it's just those type of things that we're trying to pull the service area into better operation as we go forward and then in our sand storage area we need to come up with a uh, cover system there, there's coveralls which I think it work perfect the DOT uses there's these large white tents that we can put over our sand storage and um, they prevent us from doing these tarps keep the sand dry and uh, make it much more accessible and easy to pull out when we have to get out there and respond so uh, one highlight is that with the road the repave of Alberg that is completed so that's something to celebrate and then I think overall uh, Gerwood should just build, build a general savings um, um, for street and drainage capital and the upwards of a million dollars so that you guys are ready for when the infrastructure starts failing and, the, and well all of us are ready for when the infrastructure starts failing and uh, and able to tackle things as, as it goes forward um, in the long run because bonding is not a viable resource for us at this point in time 
Uh, moving in the fire, uh, utility 41 replacement um, is needed within 22. Um, it's estimated at 75K. This is the Suburban that is the first on response, probably the most used of all the apparatuses. And so that would be needed um, for funding in 22. And then um, right now, engine 41, uh, estimated 9K, uh, 900,000K um, would be replaced. Uh, and that's being worked out right now through estimates and uh, paid back, uh, combine, combining money from the capital account along with the short-term loan paid back in that aspect. So that's what we're looking at uh, uh, for capital needs. Um, so we pushed off utility 41 because we, because we had that snow machine fire, so we have to replace the snow machine. So okay. we pushed off utility 41 until 23. Okay. So I'll put that in there and maybe you can give me the information on the snow machine. Yeah. So the snow machine will be about 70,000. Point of order, Amy. Uh, we, we extend the meeting to 10.45. Can I hear a second? I, I second. Thank you. All right, that's it. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Kyle. I'd also entertain a motion from the board to approve capital projects as listed. I'll move. Okay. Are we actually... Uh, we're not approving, I don't think we're actually approving anything on this list, are we? No, but just yeah. the list as it's presented. It's just, just yeah, nothing individual on the list. Okay. As presented. presented. Thank you, Jennifer. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Guy. Roll call. Okay, Jeff. Brianna Sullivan? Yes. I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm confused. What are we sorry. We're voting on a list as presented as capital projects for the service area. Uh, to do what with? To have it established as the list for okay. capital projects. So this huge thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Jeff Lindberg? Yes. yes. Uh, Guy Wade? Yes. Amanda Sassy? Yes. Okay. Motion passes by zero. Okay, great. Thank you, Kyle, for all of your presentations on the budget and hard work. Kyle, you did a really nice job thoroughly explaining everything just a little differently every time. So we're almost there. Number 13, Birdwood Fire Department Board of Directors request for GBOS approval of closed replacement at 27000 from the GFR 406 account. Hello again. Um, as we talked about at previous uh, GBOS meetings, uh, the uh, AFD and Gerda Fire uh, found out that they had a catastrophic. We have had a catastrophic hose problem, and uh, we've had to take out with uh, delamination of the hoses. So we've had to take out a lot of hose. Uh, at AFD, it was about 35% of the hose was declared bad, and they have to replace it. We're a little less than that, but still up there. Um, I went forward with uh, getting three quotes. We got two back, and 27,000 is a lot less than the 32,000 I initially thought it would be. And then. Because this was an unexpected large hit, um, and also the snow machine catching on fire uh, during an EMS response on Winter Creek was also a surprise. Uh, that'll be an addition. You know, the snow machine will be 17,000, so it would be 44,000, and that's the reason that I decided to push, postpone uh, Utility 41 uh, for another year. Hopefully, it will last that long. So uh, the new business tonight would be approving the hose replacement. So currently we're missing, uh, and it's a it's a large diameter hose, three inch hose, an inch and a half. Uh, currently we don't have any spare three inch. So if we do have a fire, we will probably have it break out of service for a little bit until we can get the hose dry to put back on. Um, Things you might not know about hose. Uh, it's supposed to be in life for uh, 10 years. It's hose tested every year uh, to make sure it reaches capacity, so you lose a bit of hose every time. Um, and you have to put it, you have to dry it and clean it. You have to wash it and clean it after you use it on a fire and then hang it and dry it or put it in a hose dryer. We don't have one of those. We have hose racks, so we hang it. Um, rubber hose, which is a large diameter hose, the five inch, five inch hose, that you can put away wet, but you still have to clean it when you come back. 
Um, and with those, as, the, as those fail hose testing, we will break them down and we'll make smaller hoses out of them. So um, we might start with a 100 foot hose, but then we'll end up with a 33 foot hose or a 25 foot pony hose as we cut the hoses down as it fails in certain sections. Different hose for wildland fire uh, and uh, uh, structural use, different size structure use hoses depending on if it's a supply line or an interior attack line or a large diameter hose from the hydro. Chief, have you have you um, condemned those hoses already? That yes. Yeah. Yeah, we basically got the uh, AFD called and said, you know, we you know we normally host test. It takes like a month to host test everything, and so uh, they start. They called at the start of host testing and told us to watch for this and what to look for, and then to take it out of service. Okay. So our hose is 16 to 20 years old, so it's actually past the life expectancy of it's supposed to be. But because we don't have that many fires we've actually been able to keep it in service so and then AFD had a hose supplier come in to see if they could give a credit for it um, we didn't have that supplier of hose so we didn't get any credit and I don't think they they were able to get many things through credit um, the uh, new hose that we're going to buy has a warranty on it so if this happens again it would be warranty so and it's the same, ho the same hose that AFD has. We use their spec. Any other questions for Chief Weston? We have a motion of support for hose replacement. I'd like to make a motion for support of the hose replacement, $27,000. Second. Any further discussion? Call for a vote. Brianna Sullivan? Yes. Mike Edgington? Yes. Jana for Winnegard? Yes. Guy Wade? Yes. Amanda Sassy? <clears throat> Amanda Sassy? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Okay, that's the end of old business. I see no new business. And anything else from staff? Nope. Okay. To adjourn? Yes. On the, um, the control that Tony handed out, um, Chris will point out there were some additional pages. There's like five or seven pages at the very end that is the point of communication between myself and Calais Resort. Um, they're in the doing an after time renewal for their base area. And there were some responses to specific questions that they had asked me. So they're in your packets. Um, if you want to look at them, that's fine. But maybe if you pass it on to the other pages, give it a job over. Okay, thank you, Seth. Understood. Uh, Mike, move to adjourn. Yeah, move to adjourn. Do we adjourn? Do we adjourn? Do we have to vote on that? <laughs> I'm not quite ready. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Just so you all have a copy of it. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I, you, you handed me two and I only signed one. Okay.
again? Seated it right here again? You're catching it right at the end of the growth. You know, like you're supposed to get 